Oh yeah, welcome to the University of Badassery podcast, episode 12. This is CJ Ortiz and I am the Metal Motivator. Now, something special about this particular episode in two ways. Number one, we do have a special guest in this episode, but number two... We actually had a bit of a technical error, and we lost the very first part of this interview. The majority of it is intact, and I'll pick it up here in just a second, where it cut out, power outage struck, and so we lost the first part of that intro, and a lot of uh, good information out there, so I'm just going to kind of you know, mention who we're going to have and who our sponsors are so that we can get right into where the interview picks up. Our special guest today is Tony Blauer. A lot of you may know who Tony Blauer is. He and Mac have been friends for about 20 so years. Tony Blauer was brought out by Pat Mac to the unit out at Fort Bragg to do a lot of uh, training, defense, and all this sort of stuff. And, um, Really, really a remarkable man. Tony Blauer is a true professor of badassery. He's going to get into more and more in depth about what he did working with Mac, as well as his whole systems about fear and defense and all of that. It's really, really going to blow your mind. Great, great interview today. This episode is brought to you as always by Invader Coffee, our good friends in Austin, Texas, Invader Coffee. The very best coffee, the coffee that we drink. Mac has his own Blaze Ops blend, the T-Max Blaze Ops blend, which you can get at invadercoffee.com. And our other sponsor is Taconic Distillery. And they are, in Mac's opinion, the best bourbon around. I haven't had as much bourbon as Mac has, but I love the stuff. But go to taconicdistillery.com as well. And uh, again, music provided by the intros and outros of this podcast by our friend Metal Mike, formerly of Halford and Testament and Sebastian Bach and more. So again, we lost the first part of this interview due to technical difficulties, but heck, we've got the majority of it is still intact. You're going to love this. So let's go into Mac and I with Tony Blauer. Yeah. We, we stopped talking when the power went out. So I, I'll just finish the story. Okay. Yep. Uh, Good. And, and, uh, and so, um, now they know this isn't a choreographed show. Like we're here like, what, 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 <laughs> what? But, but basically I, I, I said to the guys, I said, would you rather be trained by Ali or, or Angela Dundee? And they didn't say anything. I said, like, most people want to be trained by Ali cause he's the fighter. So if you come to Montreal and you think you're going to meet the fighter, I said two things. One, I'm not in your unit. So what do you care whether I can beat you up or not? Because that's usually, should we train with this guy? Oh, we rolled with him. We sparred with him. He can really bang or, he, you know, he, he tapped me out. And a lot of the unconscious metrics for deciding whether you can learn from somebody is whether they're tougher than you, whether they're mm-hmm. better than you or stronger than you. Yeah. And I said, I said, like, let's say you come up and we do some drills and I beat the shit out of you. You'll want me to come down. But that doesn't mean I can teach. It doesn't even mean I understand your area of operation and how I can contribute. But Let's say you beat the shit out of me. You leave and you go, he sucked. But you still don't know whether I can enhance your skill set, improve your survivability. You guys are tactical athletes. A 1% improvement in self-awareness and situational awareness or understanding weaponizing start of flinch or bringing another dimension to your scenarios could enhance survivability in a mission. And of course, I'm on the phone. I, goes, I, don't, I know exactly who you guys are on the phone, but I go, of course, I don't know who you are, but any group that has discretionary funds is probably doing like like special shit. So my suggestion is uh, I come down. Don't pay me. If I suck, just politely say you suck and I'll be on my way. If you like what I have, then we can talk about future training. And I came down and that's when I met all you guys and I was asked to stay you know, continue training and, and so on and so forth. And that, that kind of really kicked off the relationship. And it probably was like a dozen times, a bunch of times right in the middle of training, you guys got beeped and mm-hmm. had to take off. Yep. And, uh, and of course, w- one of the courses was the actual nine 11. Yep. You know, that was, that was, that was insane. You know, we're up there doing knife work in extreme close quarter. And, uh, and I remember somebody from one of the other, squadrons is standing there just watching they weren't they weren't with with you guys but they came who's this guy blower and they're standing there and you can see in that body language like this 
And I'm, uh, you know, I'm like, hey, man, body language is 60% of com- communication. You know, we got a question. And he's like, what's this got to do with our mission? Because until then, profile was more hostage rescue and stuff like that. Meanwhile, box cutters on the airplane. And I, I think, I don't know if you remember this exactly, Matt, but I, uh, um, I think that summer, a Navy SEAL was stabbed out to death outside of Hot Tuna in Virginia yep. Beach. Yep. And I said, I said, you know, the military spent a million dollars to train this guy up to this standard. And he knew how to jump out of an airplane. He knew how to blow open a door. He knew how to shoot. He knew how to do all that stuff. But he didn't know how to fight in a parking lot hmm. outside of, you know, Hot Tuna you know, over whatever, whatever started that fight. I heard it was a gang initiation or whatever, but just didn't have the wherewithal and the situational awareness without 11 guys in front of him or behind him or whatever. So we ended up going down there and man, those memories are the best, like of all the units and and groups and over and CJ, you're right. I like, I've done stuff all over with all different tier one units, but there's a, there's a special, not, I don't want to say connection, but there's like, there's something neat about that place, you know, and all those places. I mean, they're up there and I've been like in different countries and it's, I'm like a little kid when I go in there, hmm. you know, the, the last, the, the, the last unit like that in another country, I was there. I'm still, you know, it was three years ago. So I was 57. I'm still in there. Like, like a, like a seven-year-old in Toys R Us, which is out of business, <laughs> like walking around, like looking at pictures, looking at shit. Yeah. Going like, I, I just revere you guys, just what you did. The, the the courage the mission and I think I think that's one of the reasons why for some people I still have relationships with people because there was it was it was what can I do for you how can I help you like you're you're you guys risk your life to keep the world safe how can I help yeah that's interesting because I, you know I, I hold that same sort of respect for obviously from a different vantage point as a completely outside observer outside of the guys that I've met first off with Mac and then others uh, but. Yeah, but then you you take guys like Mac, who are, you know, operators amongst the operators, so to speak. And then he's out here, you know, leading the charge, teaching, instructing. And that's something now that I, I love that's developing for the both of you is, and this is my sincere hope, is that, you know, the it, it's going to get beyond, even though we, you know we treasure the the influence that experts like you, Tony, have on the most elite units and and in military law enforcement, what have you. Uh, but now also, you know, we need you. You know, because I like I tell Mac, I am a tier one civilian, so <laughs> nice. I need this kind of, you know, what I mean, this kind of teaching, this kind of influence, this kind of mentorship. And obviously, you, you're touching the the more mainstream public in that regard as well. How much of a percentage would you say between the two? Well, it, it's it's shifting daily, and 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 it's. I just want to go back because uh, you know Mac mentioned our be your own bodyguard principle. This was something that I developed in 1988, where I was teaching. I had a group of 20 women, and um, I asked them a really interesting question. I said uh, it was almost like before the word social experiment was ever a social experiment. There's no word. I came into class. I was doing this weekend seminar women only, 20 women signed up. And uh, I got really nervous because I had hallucinated a new intro that I was going to do. And I wanted to test this. And I was always in the 80s. In the 80s, I started doing like Fight Club before there was Fight Club, but we would do it with protective gear. Before I developed the high gear suit, we'd have like a hockey helmet on, hockey gauntlets, taekwondo chest guard, baseball shin guards, just this Frankenstein makeshift suit. And every month we would beat the shit of each other and we record on VHS, right? So, you know, you remember VHS, uh, you guys do, but younger people listening to this are going, what's VHS? Google it. And, um, and we would do stuff. It was always scenarios. And it's where I got this whole idea of, and all the whole reality, like I was doing reality-based training before there was an acronym RBT. And, and I would always make a joke, like, why did somebody have to come up with that acronym? Like, what other type of training is there? Unrealistic training, unreality based <laughs> training. Like, why would you do that? Right. And, um, uh, guys, we've been practicing fighting for years. Let's do some more reality. Let's this today. Let's do reality based. Okay. I, I get it. So I was doing this stuff literally for 13 years before I closed my school and just went exclusively doing seminars on the road. So I've been on the road since 1993 and, um, 
and it was interesting. Uh, two things that I that I noticed uh, uh, doing the scenarios is everybody. So we'd have like a street fighter, a boxer, a taekwondo guy, a wrestler, like all these people. Word got out, and once a month, these people would converge in my school. We'd all sign waivers, and we, but I never let people just spar. I would say, okay, you know, if you were there, I go CJ, go stand over there, pretend you're at a bar, and then Mac, you're one of the role players, and Bill, you're one of the role players. You're gonna come up, bump into the guy, you're drunk. But you're not, you're not Mac, the operator. You're a drunk going, you're a fucking, and we would make people adopt these roles. And I did this intelligently. And Mac remembers this from being a bad guy, where I'd say, like, even when we would do stuff in, in, in their fight house, in their shoot house, I'd say, I'd say, okay, Mac, you're a hysterical mother here screaming while somebody's trying to flex tie your son. So you're not like coming and doing a flying sidekick at some other guy. And what this did is interesting. It forced people not to think in sport or complex skill modalities, but more behaviorally, how would they act in a scenario? And so I noticed this going back to the 80s, that two things, everybody had a micro flinch or a major flinch when the action started. So if we were just standing there and I came to hit you, you didn't just do wax on, wax off. And of course, this was years before Karate Kid. So I noticed that everybody had a micro flinch when they would do stuff. And this kind of informed some of the stuff. You remember our startle flinch drawing techniques that, you know, a protective flinch against the sling. Like if you were moving at a guy, how we would teach the muzzle striking. It was always blending this quarter extremity movement because I knew that if a stimulus gets introduced too quickly, your reptilian brain, the amygdala, the limbic system, all this stuff, the neuroscience of protection, the human weapon system hijacks executive function. So you could say, well, I would just do this, but that doesn't happen in, in real life. It's why people miss punches, miss, miss shots and stuff like that, the flinch. So I started thinking deeply on how do I, and this wasn't, I got cool, sexy language now. How do we weaponize the start of flinch? I wasn't talking that way in the 80s. I didn't know what that was. But I noticed something else also in all these scenarios. That here'd be this guy that, that came in and, you know, he's like, yeah, I'm a street fighter. I work at this club here. I'm the doorman here. And you go, okay, this guy's going to do really well in these scenarios. And sometimes what I noticed was the people who I thought were going to do well actually quit. You know, they get sucker punched and remember we're good gear. Boom, sucker punch comes in and he's swarmed and he's turning his back and he's getting hit. Of what a lot of people, a lot of people are used to starting fights, but they weren't used to finishing fights mm. and they weren't used to being. Uh, on the receiving end of that, that preemptive strike. And, and so it revealed this gap in this, which is where the whole start of flinch came in. But this was the second thing that I noticed that was huge, that everybody who managed their fear managed to fight. Hmm. And, and those two kind of observations in the eighties became the cornerstones of the evolution of my company decades later. So this is a long answer to like, like, what are you teaching and all this? And I'm coming back to, I was telling you this story about these 20 women. And this is all like, right. so you understand the background where I came in and I had hallucinated this drill and my heart's pounding. I've got butterflies in my stomach. I'm in a freaking fear loop because I don't know how this is going to go. These people paid me and I came in, I decided I'm going to pretend this is my first self-defense class ever. And I don't know what I'm doing and I'm going to set them up and I'm going to reveal that slowly. And the deliberate intention was to have these 20, min 20 women want their money back within five minutes. Like this guy's shit. And I was like, so it was a social experiment. So I came in, I was like, hey ladies, thank you so much for coming. I'm excited to start this, my first class. Uh, let's get going. And they're like, you can see them like look at each other, like going, I thought I read his resume. It was my first self-defense class. You know, I've uh, been teaching fighting, but not self-defense. So let's get going. Hey, and this is my first question. I said, to get started, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Who here knows how to fight? Who here knows self-defense? And they're like looking at me and they're looking at their friend that they came with. Nobody. And a woman puts up her hand, very assertive. She says, um, it's a self-defense class. Like we came here to learn self-defense. Like why? I go, well, maybe you're coming for a refresher. I just want to make sure. And this is all part of the setup, guys. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew how to defend themselves. Now watch what happened. And this, the story takes five minutes. It's actually happened in two minutes. I say to them, okay, okay, so nobody knows to defend himself. Let's start. I just want to see like mindset, mindset. CJ, you're going to love this because you're a mindset guy. Mm -hmm. How many of you could defend themselves against Albert DeSalvo? 
Albert de Salva. Now, do either of you know the name? Mm-mm. Okay, so CJ doesn't. Mac does. That was the fucking Boston Strangler. Allegedly raped 2,000 women, got bored with that, started murdering them, then raping them. Okay. But a psycho. This, the FBI's most dangerous predator, serial rapist killer. So they didn't know who Albert DeSalvo was. I said, Albert DeSalvo, anyone can take Albert DeSalvo. They're like looking at me. I go, you don't know who that is? What about Boston Strangler? Oh, yeah, we all know that name. Mm-hmm. So, okay, same question. Boston Strangler. Remember, before you answer, 2,000 rapes, murdered 12 women, and then raped them. Who here could take him in a fight? These, so this is like happening in the first two minutes. Thank Welcome to my first self-defense class. Who could fight a serial rapist killer? They are <laughs> looking at me like this. So what do you think their level of confidence in me and themselves right now is? It's like yeah. integer. It's as yeah. fucking low as it can be, right? And they're like looking around. And this woman at the back, her name's Francine, she kind of puts her hand up halfway and she says, she says, well, is, uh, is he raping me or is he going to kill me? And I said, well, Francine, that's a very particular question. It's a very strange question. All I want to know is whether you'd fight him or not. She goes, well, and she reveals, she goes, I've been raped and I lived through that. And I said, but you've never been murdered and lived through that, right? She goes, right. So, so I said, let's assume it's the end of his career. He's going to kill you and then rape you. She goes, well, then I'd, I'd have to do something, right? I said, well, you're asking me a question. I want to know if you're going to fight. And she says, well, you know, I would have no choice. I would have to fight because I don't want to die. I said, anyone else with Francine? They're all like going, what? I go, okay, great. Francine, you're the only one that lived because Albert Salva, when he was caught, said he only raped and or murdered people who cooperated with him. Anybody who resists, he ran away. He was afraid to get caught. He was afraid to get hurt. He was a fucking coward who also happened to be a serial rapist killer. I said, the rest of you, 19, you're all fucking dead. Mm -hmm. I said it like that. Now they're looking at me like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> and I go, and I go, okay. Uh, uh, they, they're getting angry. And I said, listen, it's my first class. You probably, I probably should have started with like a palm strike or had to kick someone in the balls. I'm sorry. Let's start over. Now their confidence in me is zero, zero, zero. They're like looking at their friends. And I say, how many of you have kids? Almost all of them are kids. I said, how many of you have babysitters? They're all babysitters. You went out shopping, you come home, the front door slightly open and you come in and you see the babysitter has duct tape over her mouth. She's tied up on the floor. Mac, have you ever heard this story? Yep. Okay, cool. Heard it. It's great. It's great. Yeah. Duct tape, duct tape on the floor and her eyes are darting. There's someone in the house, but you figured that out. And you, the mom has moved in. You know, your kid isn't there. There's someone in your house. You put down your groceries, you hear some noise in the kitchen. And as you come around, you see the back of somebody he's got headphones on he's dancing to, you can hear this crazy music and he's slowly taking down his pants and your kid is tied up on the kitchen table that's as far as i get and the room erupts how dare you what the fuck kind of class is this woman in the front row woman in the front row uh, uh screams at me veins coming out of her throat how dare you put that image in my mind I will fucking kill anybody who tries to harm my family. I will rip his fucking heart out. Mm. I calm everyone down, CJ. And I go, I go, ma'am, what did you just say? She's like, she goes, what kind of fucking class is this? What is going on? And I go, what did you say you were going to do to this guy? She says, I'll rip his fucking heart out. I said, you know, medically that's impossible, but I like where your head's at here. Mm -hmm. And they're like, look at me. And I said to them, I said, all of you are like attacking this, this, this person trying to harm your kid. What is it you saw yourself doing to protect your kid that you don't see yourself doing to protect yourself? Mm. And they kind of looked at me. I said, 60 seconds ago, I asked you if you would fight Albert DeSalvo, a five foot seven, 145 pound coward. And you all went, oh, and now you, you're ripping someone's heart out. What is it you saw yourself doing to protect someone you love that you didn't see yourself doing to protect yourself? And they all just looked at me. I said, you're your kid's bodyguard, right? And they're like, yeah. I go, so who's your bodyguard? Mm. And that was that moment. Like mm. that, that became the whole be your own bodyguard metaphor for the, you know, the whole sentinel connection. You're like a tier one VIP in your life. Mm. And I would tell people, most of us are never going to have bodyguards. 
We, our, our corporation's not going to invest in it. We don't have enough money to have somebody, you know, open our doors and drive us somewhere. And anyways, it was a very, very heavy thing. So we've always, it was a very long answer. Apologize. No. Uh, um, but it's very powerful because anyone listening, whether they get to train with Mac or get to train with me, if you don't, you got to realize that you've got immense uh, emotional, psychological force called indignation. It's a special type of anger. Mm-hmm. Like, like this, and, I, and it's one of the things in our courses we talk about. Don't get angry. It's indignation. Indignation is this, how dare you? Mm-hmm. And every one of us has it. Now, if you can channel indignation and instinctive natural movement, and you learn how to handle, use a knife or a gun or an improvised weapon, or actually learn, you know, some of the stuff that we teach, that's just going to augment. But you can see, like, even it's one of the reasons Mac and I have been friends for a couple of decades now is because it wasn't about the complex motor skills and, and, and the tricks. It was always about uh, the mindset and, and, and that, that mental resilience and fear management. Mac, can you echo that? Yeah. You know, what Tony teaches, anybody can pick up, pretty much anybody. Now, it's not going to be, for instance, I have my go-to, you know, weapons. I'm not necessarily going to go and uh, right into a spear if I get fucked with. That's one of Tony's tools. But the whole, like, ballistic microfight mindset, dude, it is so freaking badass. It's funny, Tony, because I, I so resonate with you because I we think very much the same, although I'm obviously not applying it to anything like you're addressing. Mine's kind of more the personal development thing, but I always use this phrase called righteous anger. Mm. It's, mm. A, it's a healthy thing. So people tend to, to see it exclusively as a negative emotion. Right. Right? So I'll ask people, I'll say, well, you have to be angry. And I said, and you have to hate. Hatred is a good thing. I said, please don't tell me you're, you're happy with sex trafficking, that you're indifferent to it, that you're, right. that you have no anger or ra- healthy rage about what happens to children and, and how women are abused. Please don't tell me you're happy with that shit. You know, because without these emotions, we can't drive ourselves to, you know, do the things that are required to save and help the weakest of our society. So to see, and I think you're right. I think, you know, it's, it really does come down. And I think that's why mindset, right. is such an important thing because, it's like if I've got somebody with heart, if I've got somebody like even the selection process they do in the unit, you know, it not necessarily the biggest or strongest guy. They're looking for that right guy. And I would think that all of them have that at least one thing in common. They've all got that heart. They've all got mm-hmm. that that thing about them that can that can turn on. So, Mac, echoing that. Yeah, right. Now, w- one of the things that um, one of the big things I got out of Tony's training was and it's right off of what you're saying here is um, not everybody has moxie, you know, or kutzbah, but Tony was one of the first guys that uh, with his training methodology, you know, you can't replicate the pressure of a, of a street fight, of a real street fight in a boxing ring or something like that, you know, one-on-one, but you can incorporate these snippets of pressure to allow you to help compartmentalize these pressures. And I was able to bring that training methodology like to the range and stuff like that. Uh, because it, it works full training spectrum. If I, if I can jump in there, Mac. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. you mentioned ballistic microfight, which nobody listening would know what that means. It's like ballistic. Mm-hmm. So w- when I came up with the ballistic microfight, it was out of this research for 13 years doing scenarios, force on force scenarios. I realized that, that there was like the, the proverbial X where the ambush happened. And most people practice that in, in more of a conventional warfare sense where I said, look, this ambush can happen in business, in a relationship. It can happen uh, in a street fight. It can, and, and then in the street fight, did it happen at the gas station? Did it happen at ATM? Did it happen for a cop just as you were going to put a cuff on him and you're at this three o'clock position? And then the guy hits you with a sucker punch because you're looking down at his hand. So we figured out a formula where you could just, and using what Mac talked about compartmentalizing, we would take a sliver of this realistic event and then we would build a short explosive attack around that. That's where the name ballistic micro fight came from. So we'd say, if this real fight took 20 seconds, let's look at it this first three seconds. What happened here? And let's do that over and over again. Primal protective tactical primal. And what you were actually doing is, and I didn't know this at the time because it was the 80s when I was experimenting with this, but decades later, neuroscience 
came out with, with nomenclature describing brain-based learning, interleaving effect, myelinization of neurotransmitters, neural pathways. That's what I was doing. If I said, if I said, Mac, Mac loves boxing, I love boxing. If I said, Mac, let's practice moving our head and countering, we might be in the ring for three minutes and maybe we throw 20, 30 punches in three minutes and we move our head 20, 30 times, jab, 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 slip, right? But if we do a ballistic micro fight <laughs> for one minute, you're actually doing these short explosive movements that are very specific to a scenario. So ballistic, not kinetic, ballistic, explosive, short is like, we're going to do this, this 10 second rep and we're going to focus on this and focus on this. And what we were doing is creating this amazing, I called it a mental blueprint, awareness of what's happening. And, and three things would happen. One is the first thing we had a drill called emotional climatization. The first thing was getting over this, this, the blast of the attack, right? So it's why, you know, you could be at the range and this, you know, someone, someone forgets to yell fire in the hole and a breach goes off and, and like there's a micro flinch, but you don't flinch if you expect it, right? So stimulus gets introduced too quickly, but we would do this emotional adaptation and then a psychological and then a physical. And we would do it over and over again so that your body actually went, okay, I know what to do here. And, and, and uh, so the ballistic microfight was actually creating all of these, it was almost like if your brain is a hard drive and then that's your RAM, right? Something happens in a fight and there's a movement here where you go, your brain is immediately downloading. Hey, we, we know I, we have this maxim that uh, until you're emotionally and psychologically in control of yourself and physically dominating your threat, don't move to a complex motor skill. So we would start off with primal gross motor movement, then move into slowly move into this tactical point of domination, athletic, and, and then movement. I'm in a deep rabbit hole. Right. Uh, ho hopefully a lot of your listeners are into tactical shit because most people are going, I have no idea what he's talking about. I'm going to go get a call. Dude, they can rewind. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I, we get people write and say, I've listened to that podcast four times. Um, right. now, now, Mac, when, when Tony came out mm -hmm. to brag, um, you brought him out on the fighting stuff, how soon before you saw how this could be applied to other, like talking about something like micro flinch and all yeah, that kind of stuff. Right. It, it was, I would say it was immediate just with the, uh, well, because, and you've heard me say this before, in order to be a teacher, you want to present a message that is palatable to the intended recipient. You have to be the right person who's going to say the right thing to the right person at the right time. So, um, I'm big into that, that teaching thing. I love to teach stuff. So right away, just the teaching style, I was like, oh man, this is great. I mean, you've heard me talk about teaching before. One mm -hmm. of the best classes I ever took was a freaking how to write a grant, a U.S. Gr a, a grant, a mm -hmm. grant. Right. I mean, that's the most boring freaking. So now think about teaching, you know, fighting and mindset. If a guy could actually teach that, because now it's exciting too. So right away, it was instant that, um, you know, uh, I just like the teaching style, the methodology, the flow, yeah. the delivery. So that was spot on for me as a recipient. Um, it was, and then um, let me back up to, to ballistic microfight. You know, I could, I could teach like in, in a Sentinel class, I teach some basic fighting, but I could tell them, uh, bring up ballistic microfight and they get it. So, you know, because, and Tony touched on this too, a predator human is just like a predator in the wild. They need to take easy prey. You know, they're not going to, they're not going to screw with somebody who's fighting back. So even if a, a, a 100 pound soak, you know, soaking wet, 100 pound female doesn't know how to fight. If she just ballistic micro fights, kicks, scratch, punches, slaps, you know, just goes batshit screaming at the top of her lungs. That dude is, is, is going to want to <laughs> tangle with that. You know what I'm saying? Right. So yeah, it's a great methodology. I dig it. So when you then had him out, first of all, did you sense any skepticism from other guys? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, with anybody that, cause I brought in a few different people when you're teaching the world's baddest mofos, something, uh, there's always going to be skepticism, but Tony resonated very well with us. Like I had other guys out and I, and I'd have to brief these guys. I would have to say, Hey, if you're, <laughs> <laughs> there was one guy, I'm not going to mention his name because he was a great guy. Um, but I watched him train other people, other units. And I participated in that training. When I brought him to, to the unit, 
I said, Hey, if you're going to sink a move, I'm one of these guys sink it to fucking kill them mm. because, because they're going to challenge the hell out of you. So, and, and this guy didn't take my advice and, uh, he, he sunk like a rear naked choke on a big, very athletic dude. And the guy mocked him and credibility <laughs> gone just like that. I mean, it was instant. He just lost credibility and it was instant loss of credibility. So Tony didn't, he wasn't teach. He wasn't showing how badass he was. He was showing how badass we can be, you know, right. I want to interject something there. Cause this is one of, in our, you know, most of my work is training trainers at different organizations and, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, departments and stuff like that. What I loved about working with, with Mac and the rest of the guys there is it was an end user class. I could really, I was like, I could just freestyle and, mm -hmm. and see where they wanted to go. We did some of the most crazy drills uh, <laughs> and to the point where they say, what do you got for multiple sailing? What do you got on the ground? We go on the ground and I would teach them. Remember I was teaching you tactical get up with, with M4s? Yep. And showing you like, like just like, so it wasn't like, I, I, I was very mindful of always saying to those, to them Socratically, where are you? What are you doing? How much equipment would you have? You know, what do you, what, you know, how long do you have to clear this room? What do you, and then I would, I just, I'm like a mad scientist like that, but everything like the ballistic microfight is a formula. The emotional climate training drill is a formula. And this is one of the things why Mac at the time, it resonated because he had this love of coaching and mentoring and teaching, but he wasn't really uh, doing that then, although you were, I mean, you were, you were, you were showing right. people stuff. And it was, and I think it was very um, influenced by your love of boxing and wrestling mm -hmm. type stuff at the time. And then I'd see Mac, I'd come back and, you know, he'd be, he'd be in the room, fucking half spearing, you know, half spearing, you know, like, which is like a, the, the half spears are physical forearm using a forearm like a tactical windshield wiper and then come off a long gun smash that come across with a right blending the stuff in there but everything that we taught was a formula so when guys understood it so when you're asking cj how quickly did this become relevant in other areas you could take a kidnapping scenario a pistol scenario a multiple assailant scenario and you just drop it in to these the the formula that I created, we go PIA. What's the first move? PIA is primary initiation attack. What's the first move the bad guy's got to do right here? Right? Okay. Uh, will that trigger a flinch here given the circumstances? Okay. So what's the first thing? That if, and then you would go from slow motion to medium to full speed to, you know, the, they had a bunch of my hider suits. When we go in, when we go into the house, guys would get in gear. So they'd be using marking cartridge and and trying the stuff out now, it's almost like like you guys are into music. You know, your favorite guitarist doesn't come out and go, what do you think of this solo? You know, and start going. Right. And there are guys that are great, but when they're writing a song, they're going, this is the key, this is the first note. I'm gonna start it here. And the second this second note is sick, right? right? And then and then they start working that. And that's how I that's how I taught the ballistic microfight. There's gonna be an emotionally, psychologically influenced response here as you threat discriminate, how much danger I'm in, what do I need to do to this person? Am I in good position to do that emotionally, psychologically? And it was a formula, and again, going down a deep rabbit hole, but you could literally, I could leave, and then if the guys understood the formula, that could influence or inspire other training to uh, validate also theoretical training, if that makes sense. Now, Tony, at some point, again, you, you got from the guy I saw on the cover of Black Belt, yeah. To this type of thing where it's we're we're well, we're way beyond a roundhouse yeah. kick and a side kick and all that kind of you know, what was that transition for you? When did you say I gotta go beyond, you know, the martial arts guy? So I always had a love and fascination. I remember driving out to you remember, remember Jerry Beasley, Karate College, Joe Lewis, Bill mm -hmm. Wallace. Oh yeah, yeah. All of that. So I got invited to teach there in like nineteen ninety two or three. And I'm driving from Montreal all the way down, and the route I took took me through Virginia Beach. And I'm with one of uh, one of my uh, students in the car, and he's going to come assist me. And we're driving through, and I see the sign for Little Creek, and I think it was around 
you know, when uh, Rogue Warrior came out and there was a lot of attention on seals. And as I drove by, I saw the little Little Creek, Naval Special Warfare, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I turned to this guy in the car with me and I said, I can't wait to take to teach Navy SEALs and other special operators. Hmm. And he looked at me, we're driving. He said, well, how are you going to do that? And I said, I don't know. I'm just going to do that one day. Like I just knew yeah. like, like, like shit. Um, you know, when, Sh- when Sugar Ray Leonard fought Duran in Montreal, mm-hmm. uh, it was 1980. Yep. And so, and a, a huge boxing night. And, and one of my students says, Hey, did you hear they signed the Duran Leonard fight here? And I said, it was 1980. I said, Oh my God, I can't wait to meet Sugar Ray Leonard. <laughs> my favorite boxer. And they're like, how are you going to do that? And I said, I don't know. I'll figure it out. And sure mm-hmm. enough, I spent two weeks with him. Right. And, and, and uh, so there were all like these things I just knew. And then I would just make shit happen, man. Yeah. I, I wrote a, I wrote a post the other day, you know, when I was 15, I got jumped when I was 12 and uh, beaten up by two high school kids, went home, told my dad, he said, I'd wrestled for years, uh, but I got suckered by these two guys pointed like, yeah, the school's over there. And, fucking they grabbed me and I can be I wasn't hurt and my dad said oh, you got to learn some martial arts and so I found a taekwondo school near me and as soon as I started training it was like mm, you know it was like mm-hmm. it was like wow I felt this personal power and that became became this progression but when I was doing that and I started the training when I was 15 years old I'm on the floor looking at Bruce Lee magazines mm-hmm. trying to do the splits and my mom says, you know, so you're 15, you're going to go to, uh, you're going to be graduating to high school soon. Have you figured out what you're going to do? And back in the seventies, your options were, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, <laughs> right? Family business, or like, I guess you're going to be like just average and do something, right. whatever. She says, what are you going to, what are you going to do? You're going to go into family business. You're going to be a lawyer, a doctor. And I looked at her and this is what I said. I said, actually, mom. I'm going to be a famous martial artist like Bruce Lee. I'm going to develop my own self-defense system. Mm. Said that to her. Yeah. You know, and she pat me on the head. She said, okay, <laughs> here, we'll talk about this when you're older. Like I just knew shit. And then, and what I wrote the other day is that I, you know, I turned 60 on Saturday. I haven't stopped thinking about my craft, mm. practicing, writing, developing. I haven't missed a day. And if I missed a day working out, I was still working my mind on it. Mm-mm-mm. Dude, I, I I I can't tell you how many amens are going off in me. You know, Mac and I talk about this kind of stuff. Well, this is my whole metal loss, the exact same thing for you. Even as it gets into that faith, speak, speak it, and it becomes a reality. Not, I'm not talking about law of attraction. I'm right. talking about a there's just a knowing. There's just a knowing. You are so at one with who you are. You know who you are. I think Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, called it following your bliss, right? You if you've really followed your the depths of who you are, your passion, your goal, your calling, your purpose, and things are going to open up for you that would never have opened up for you before and would not open for somebody else. But there's some, there's a genuine, real power there. And the thing that I appreciate about all this is your sense of what I call, uh, call it the sacred duty, the sacred duty you have to yourself to maximize all that you are, all that you can do for a purpose greater than yourself. That that's fulfillment, way better than happiness, which is fleeting, way better, full fill. I, I love a word that's got full in it and fill in it. It's like, right. that's satisfaction. And the only way you're going to get that cannot come from anything externally. It has to come from who you are. It has to come from maximizing everything that you can do, skills, ability, knowledge, experience, resources. It's got to come from who you are as a person. Are you somebody that you can go to sleep with yourself every night? You know, that your conscience is clear, that you know you're everything you can be as a father, as a friend, as an employer, as a husband, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things, that that's fulfillment. And I love the fact that you have tied that into this and you took up that obligation to say, yeah, I mean, I'm going to go be as famous as Bruce Lee, but tied to that is I feel like I have a responsibility. It's not just a, you know, it's just not a, a stroke of an ego. Right. There's a responsibility there. And, and I think a lot, a lot of people are, you know, obviously what I share now, I'm 60. I, I, when I, for, for decades, when I would tell that story, I'd never mentioned Bruce's name right. I, in that context. I would say I was inspired by Bruce Lee and I knew I told him, and I, it was more, I just thought it just sounded obnoxious to say I was going to be famous like Bruce Lee as a kid. 
you know, he was so many people's idols. Right. Um, and, but I would say that, you know, how I used to explain it in, in previous interviews is, is, you know, his mom says, what are you going to do when you're older? I said, uh, uh, yeah, school is not going to be that important. I'm going to be like Bruce Lee and develop my own, you know, but the kid wanted to be famous. I wanted to be out there. Uh, and that's, that's self-awareness and tempering that to that you're to speak on what you said about fulfillment, where like, even, even today I'm going, dude, this isn't about you. This is about helping other people. When I was 20, I got asked by venture capitalists, you know, what do you, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to help make the world safer. And he's like, Whoa, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I've got this idea for a generic approach to self-defense. It's based on how humans naturally move and it's got to be blended with, this idea of how do I manage fear? Like I had these ideas, but I didn't know what they were. It was almost putting it out there. And now I had to figure out how to make that happen. I remember my first student, 1980, got his ass kicked in a fight. And when he was describing what happened to him, as soon as he finished, I apologized to him for losing. And he looked at me, he said, coach, he goes, I lost the fight. I should be apologizing to you. I said, no, I didn't prepare you properly. Now I understood in the moment what happened and I described this as like the God of self-defense hit me with a lightning bolt. And I went, Oh my God, we teach self-defense wrong. That created a pivot in 1980 where everything I did went through a scenario filter, which asked the question, this is like decades before Simon Sinek's what, why mm -hmm. I go, why are we doing this? Right. Why are we practicing this? Right. You know? And that influence, that's what created ballistic microfight, created high gear, created these. So we would do scenarios. Out of the scenario training, I go, why is everybody covering their head in that initial moment? Why is that? Whatever the movement is. You ask a forensic specialist where there's always trauma in a knife fight, in a gun fight with somebody, right. they're going to say always in the hands. So you ask a paramedic or a firefighter, someone goes through their windshield without their seatbelt on, where's there always trauma? hands because you don't go through the windshield like this you go you're and I, I started thinking like why what is that that the hands can get up to protect your head that fast why does that happen and you see it in pro fighters you see you know i, I remember uh, uh watching like some of the best mma guys get surprised with like when the superman punch started coming in and you see these guys and they're in the flow and you'd see them cover you know and it wasn't like a technical move you could see it was a real protective response. So there was a lot of, uh, I stayed open to allowing the universe to kind of like inform me. I felt more like an architect than someone manipulating something. And that's when I said, we're all human weapons. How do, how do we, how do we rediscover we've been domesticated? And, and then a lot of us, because of our love of the, the, the coolness of certain martial arts. And I used to tell people, be careful what you practice so you don't get good at the wrong thing. <laughs> Every practice, you might get really good at the wrong thing. Right. And, and people would think I was putting down their stuff. And what I was intuitively talking about was there's no such thing as muscle memory in the literal sense. But what there is, is like neural pathways that you see something, it's a stimulus response, right? And, right. and that's that neurotransmitter saying, do this, do that. And we've got right. to be careful of that. You know, I love this, the spiritual dynamic that we're on here, because it's something we don't get to talk about a whole lot. There's, it's, ironically, uh, just this morning, my son, who was doing some technical work for me on my website, so he's going back through old articles or something I wrote years ago, and I did, a, I did a series on it in my coaching group years ago as well, and it's called Bruce Lee's Secret to Greatness. Mm. And I was covering a bunch of people. I was covering Billy Jack and Arnold and some other people. Mr. Ryan did a whole week series on Mr. Rogers. Um, <laughs> and so I did one on Bruce Lee. It's Bruce Lee's Secret to Greatness. And it was, I, I showed a video that uh, his daughter Shannon did at his little Bruce Lee museum. And, she, and it goes into his library, which is massive. Bruce Lee's library was massive. And so, you know, I understood Bruce Lee as obviously martial arts expert and movie star as a kid. It wasn't until I got older that I understood Bruce Lee as philosopher. It was a whole different thing. And he was so damn versed in philosophy, philosophy yeah. of all kinds of fighting. And I think, so I, I based it on this concept of enter the dragon. In other words, you can't say enter the dragon and not think Bruce Lee. So he, in that sense, incarnates the idea, the dragon idea. 
And so for me, that's what, I, when I teach branding, I say, that's the ultimate branding. That's the ultimate personal brand. Branding is not a label. Branding ultimately is when you incarnate an idea, when an idea becomes physical form. So like I look at Mac and I say, Mac is the embodiment of Sentinel. And that's what's going to take him to the moon right there is just the fact that he embodies that particular idea. Not so much that he's just somebody who's out there protecting other people, but they like to, they might see him that way, but that that's how he sees himself literally. Mm. And so it's going to manifest as not just watching your six at times, but it's also going to manifest as equipping you. Like, you know, I was at his house, um, one of the last times we did the podcast at his house and I'm talking to Rebecca, his wife. And next thing you know, he comes up to me and he says, you got a flashlight, <laughs> you know, and he starts. And I said, well, at the house I do. <laughs> he's like, no, on you. I said, no. So he's like, he comes, go disappears, comes back. He's got this little tactical, cool ass flashlight. He goes, here, I want you to take this, check this out, do this, do this, do this. And then about gun training. I mean, he is on my ass like saran wrap about whatever. It's never overbearing. It's never domineering. It's completely out of his flow. It's completely out of who he is. It's one of the things I love about that movie, Unbreakable. It's about the, the hero. There is a hero in all of us. And when I was a kid, this was how I guess eventually I learned what the concept of inspiration was altogether. Inspiration as that, that word inspire, in other words, to breathe in. We think of expire as in breathing out, but inspire is to breathe in you know, to breathe something in. And I think that's what happened when we were kids and you watch Enter the Dragon for the first time and you come home and you and your brothers disappear for two hours outside arguing over who gets to be Bruce Lee. You know, no matter what the action movie was, you were inspired, meaning you became something more than you were. Right. You know, and that's what's important that everybody's got to live by to live inspired every day is not just motivated. It's to see yourself because the the bigger you see yourself, the smaller resistance becomes, right? <laughs> so we want to have that more dominant, you know, outlook on things. And I love, Tony, that you truly embody this. Like you said, man, you know, okay, just had your 60th birthday. Dude, you are, nothing has, has there's no toning down. <laughs> there's no, you know what I mean? You are still just as much, you are still just as much 21 Tony Blower as you are now. You know what I mean? There's that energy and that inspiration there. You're living out this narrative of a, that's a hero's life, man. Thank you, man. I, uh, it's funny. The, um, I started teaching again as a pivot to the pandemic because, uh, like Mac, my live classes stopped, uh, when the lockdown happened and there's like for a day, it was cute. And then I went, Oh shit, this isn't good for business. And then, you know, we had, I've got, uh, you know, Mac, is is mac so he doesn't have a team you want to train with mac i had 15 years ago started to scale and i had a team so i i i postponed 15 courses in a six-week period and i had trainers all over the world stuff mm. in australia stuff in the uk stuff and and i'm going okay this isn't sustainable i could lose everything if this i don't know how long is going on and and so one of the concepts in my team came up with is you know, I'm going to start teaching again because there's a lot of people that can never teach. Could, there's a lot of people who can't train with Mac because of geography or finances. Right. But imagine if Mac started coaching people online. Holy mm -hmm. shit, right? And right. so enter Patreon. Enter, enter. you know, doing like a live thing in a private portal. I'm going to show you some shit and I'm going to watch you do it and I'm going to coach you and there's going to be videos. So I started doing this garage gym thing as a way to just save the company. Right. If I can get enough people in here, got some revenue coming in and I appreciate the, the uh, about 74 people signed up like right away within three days. Wow. And that was about the size of my classes back in Montreal in the eighties. <laughs> and, uh, and so and the reason I'm telling you this story, CJ is because you said you got the energy of a 21 year old. So I, I started teaching full time in 1979, 1980. So I was 1920. Uh, not 1920, 1920 years old. And people would go, how old is this fucker? Um, um, and I would, I would show up at, at my school early and go, oh my God, I have my own martial arts school. It happened. I'm making this happen. I like, I'm teaching self-defense and I was so excited, but I didn't know what I know right now. So now I'm in my garage. I start teaching this. This is two weeks old. And it's all I think about every day. I've stopped doing all the other CEO shit. I'm like preparing for my class. I taught just before we got on here, but it's, 
it's the it's the 20 year old energy with the 40 years of research and understanding mm -hmm. in how to teach methodology the neuroscience so it'd be like if i could take my brain from today go back in time and it's so surreal it's yeah. it's i'm like shit okay class is over i gotta go does anyone have any questions like you know and i can't stop but it's it comes back to that fulfillment self-actualization uh, and i wanted to touch and talk a little bit about for those of you are, who can see this image because out of all of this, this research was this idea that the people who manage their fear manage to fight and the fight is a metaphor for life mm -hmm. deep down inside of us we all know what's right into our intuition whispers in our mind you can do better you want to do this. You don't need to work. And I always tell people fear throttles everything we do from who we talk to, therefore who we marry, from how much weight we lift, to how much money we make, to where we live. You know, some great questions uh, that I've heard over the years. Um, I forget the, uh, the motivational speaker. Uh, his name just escaped me. But he asked this question. He said, if you didn't know how old you were and you looked in the mirror, how old would you think you were? If you didn't know where you lived and you could look at all the places in the world to live, where would you want to live and why aren't you living there? If you didn't know what job you did and you looked at all the jobs you could do, what job would you want to do and why aren't you doing that? And so if I said to Mac, there's, there's no more need for money. Money's taken care of. There's mortgages taken care of. Food is taken everything care of. What would you, what do you want to do? I guarantee the Mac that said, you don't have a flashlight on you is still the Mac. I've been to his house. We've hung out. We've had beer. And I said this to you the other day when we were talking. Some people might think that Mac is a character, that he's another guy playing the character, mm -hmm. but Mac is Mac. That's why he's so cool, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like, he's that enthusiastic and he's yeah. that focused on, on fitness, on fighting and protection and all this stuff. And so that's that fulfillment, that self-actualization because of self-awareness. And so this, you know, where this little, this little rant leads to is our ability to get to know fear and to embrace fear as a cathartic process. But the only way you do that is by changing your relationship with fear. That if you, you're you about to go, okay, I'm going to get divorced. I'm scared. Okay, I'm going to get married. I'm scared. Okay, I'm going to start a new business. I'm going to quit this. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I got to tell the truth here. I got to defend myself here. And you're scared. The fear spike in those normal settings is a cathartic moment for you to move in. But most people haven't been taught, and I wasn't taught as a kid, how to embrace fear. I was a, so, you know, one of my goals <laughs> this year is to re remove the stigma of fear. People are afraid of the word fear, right? And yeah. so if I say fear management seminar, people are afraid to attend it because they don't like the word <laughs> fear, but, but psychologically, they don't even know, understand it. it's like this unconscious effect. Right. And then they're like, I'm good. I don't need that. I'm type A. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, all right, Mac, um, talking about this you know, being who you are and tying that now to kind of what Tony touched on, which is, okay, man, business, is, business has been affected, right? And you mm -hmm. have been, Mac, a hands-on, in the present, face-to-face -face with people. Right. You've been shut down now. You don't know how much longer you're going to be shut down, but mm -hmm. you're not anxious to just go back to what things were before. How do you see, I mean, who you are as the Sentinel, as the trainer, how are these things transitioning into what's coming ahead? Well, because we set up that, that uh, coaching squad, it's still, you know, I'm still able to um, provide good information, make people better people, uh, make them their own Sentinels and, uh, you know, impart good uh, quality, like instruction online and all that. And I like that where we're going with it too. It's not just the shooting and the fighting stuff, yeah. <laughs> but like the land nav stuff, you know, yeah. people went, holy crap, this is the best class I ever had, man. It's mm -hmm. just a 10 minute freaking land nav course. So man, once again, full fill, <laughs> you know, dude, yes. I'm getting fulfilled off of that. That's some good stuff right there. And it's nothing for me to bust out the camera and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, record a eight to 10 minute block on something because I've got a bunch of them. I mean, and they're all over the map. So you feel, I'm, I'm, I'm digging it. I want to throw something in here. So the, like on that subject, you get, you know, 12 or 14 people fly in, uh, you know, you got to coordinate, you know, when you're going to get together, you got to watch the weather. If you're doing stuff outside, you got to get together. This guy's got to go to the bathroom. This guy's not in the shape he should have right. been. You're teaching them, you're doing this stuff. 
guys like you and I have not even figured out how to tap the potential of the internet. And we couldn't have done this 20 years ago. No. The, the, the speed of the internet now allows this where, you know, I could sit with you and ask you a hundred questions about survivability and the sentinel philosophy. And, you know, like even to the point of like, Hey, take me to the store and show me how you actually pick produce and, and d design how you eat. Like, what, what are you doing for, for sustenance? What are you doing for energy systems? Well, I could be thinking that at your shooting class and you turn around and you go, okay, anyone have any questions? I go, Mac, can you talk to me about carbs, protein, and fat, and just what you understand? You go, uh, no, you can't, right? But with, with the online stuff, and I want to tell you, like, what emerged out of the pandemic for me was it revealed under that pressure things that I could have and should have been doing before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then if it stopped right now, as much as I love doing live classes, this garage gym is never stopping because I've never, it's like the fountain of youth for me. I fucking love it. And, and, um, but I can go off on any tangent I want because I'm seeing people four times a week and it's recorded. I can go off and I can pick up shit. And so the, when I hear you talk about land nav, you can't do a land nav block in a pistol class. Guys, because right. because maybe one guy, you know, any questions? Yeah, Mac, can you like stop shooting for a moment and go over some land nav principles? <laughs> like 11 other guys are going to go, what the fuck? No, no. <laughs> I, I, right? So I'm super excited for you guys. Because all of these other skills that you cultivated, both from all the training you've done around the world and then just how you are as a protector, you can now have like a hundred chapters mm -hmm. in based on any question and and it's evergreen, right? It's just it's always mm -hmm. there for people. It's amazing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that me and uh, Mac, I want we we go back and forth via email, text, whatever, all the time. And so just kicking around ideas and uh, we were talking about the possibilities here and then just saw what the initial feed with the initial response to the coaching squad that we launched is it's been overwhelming just you know, mm -hmm. guys are signing up left and right and gals but you know throughout all of it i i said you know what mac from here on out every strategy session we have i don't care how good it is and how many cool things come out of it I want to make the commitment that at the end of every meeting we have, we will conclude with this statement. We're not thinking big enough. Damn straight. Yeah. Just not yep. thinking big enough. Nope. Nope. Yeah. As soon as you put the brakes on, you know, you're going to slow down. You know, there, there's the <laughs> thing about, you know, it's the, the difficult part that I have is I can be an in front of the camera guy and I can also go behind the camera. So it's like, you know, Ron Howard, you know, plays right. a character and then becomes a director or, you know, switch to a, a Quincy Jones switches to a producer. So I get torn between those two. So I, you know, I get a hold of somebody like Mac or even like yourself, you know, guys who have personality, guys who have drive, drive guys who are natural communicators can create their own philosophies, write their own books, do these own things. I'm like, Oh my God, I could take this thing to empire right. status quick because that's the marketer in me. And so for me, it's like, okay, well, you know, I, I can do what I want to do on my own, but when I get around guys like you, I think, oh my God, this could be so much bigger. This could mm -hmm. be so much broader. And there's so many other people that can be helped. And you'd think that being at the apex of history right now, here we are, the United States, the greatest country that's ever existed, the richest country that's ever existed. We can press buttons, things come on, just temperature, warm up food in a microwave. Holy crap, talk on phones, do this shit right here. And yet we still find reason to complain. But besides all that, you, this, is, this is where we are at the apex of technology. And yet people have never been so deplorable, mm -hmm. never been so weak, never been so disturbed, never been so crazy, never been so violent, never been so unaware of history, unaware of tradition. Haters of it, almost confused about a hundred different genders. That's that's we've we haven't learned a damn thing about the essentials for life, which makes it a dangerous place in that regard. Which means now you have to rely on, like like you said, to you're not gonna you're not walking around with bodyguards. Most of us are not walking around with bodyguards. 
Therefore, the technology you need to be most concerned about is this technology here, managing state, managing mindset, awareness, you know, all of these things. So this kind of puts both of you kind of in that similar sort of category. So it's like, okay, well, then we've got to equip a lot of people. Now, it's great to equip is, you know, you have tier one and SWAT guys and God knows who else. It's great to equip all of them. Do you know, how do, how do we get this now to the everybody? That's your job, man. Mac and I yeah, are right on. <laughs> You're the marketing wizard. I'm the marketing arm. Right. I'm the marketing arm of these two. Right. Um, no, you're uh, no. It's it's uh, it. You know, it's a, a great idea in your garage. Is still in your garage. You know, we we, we got to get it out there, and and uh, but I, I you know it's something you know I, I started to 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 explain a little bit about it where I realized when I peel the proverbial onion with anybody, it always comes down to their relationship with fear, you know, and it could be, should I sign up for max class? Should I sign up for Patreon? Should I go to Tony's garage gym? Should I get his no fear program? There's an unconscious, like it's, this is a silly example, but if I can't decide if I want to order a steak or fish, there's a part of me at some deep weird level that's afraid to make the wrong choice. Right. Just pick, just right. pick, right? But how often do we go? What do you want to watch? To eat? You want to watch Netflix tonight? Pick a movie. Right. I don't know. Part of us we don't want to waste our time. We don't, and it's this weird, noxious relationship with fear and making the wrong, the wrong choice. And and how does this tie to how do we get it out there and how we do? Uh, you know, I say this as a joke, and you laughed. There's this stigma about fear. If I, if part of my brain thinks the cavalry will rush in. Mm -hmm. then my fear of violence is redirected as there's nothing I can do about it. And someone else is going to fix it for me. Um, If uh, I had two women sign up for a class I was doing in the eighties and I, I, my school was in this industrial park. This is a true story on the way there. They got mugged Hmm. at gunpoint and relieved of their purses and their jewelry. They never saw if the guy had a gun, he had his hand in his pocket pointing. Might have been a gun, might not have been. But they didn't show up for the class. Everyone prepaid. I called them at the first break because I call everyone the day before. And I said, hey, ladies, like I spoke to you yesterday, you're going to come. And this woman, she goes, well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 we're not coming. I go, well, I realize that. I mean, we already started, but is everything okay? Because yesterday you said you were coming. They said, yeah, you know, something happened on the way there and we couldn't make it. I was like, well, well what happened? She goes, we got mugged. Okay, we got mugged. And I'm thinking, if I got mugged on the way to a self-defense seminar, I would then run, my personality is I would run to the seminar and go, did you fucking set that up to like right. enhance the, like the, 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 the obligation and, and reality? Of, but they, what they did is they realized, I'm so scared, I couldn't have done anything. I wouldn't have known how to defuse this, had it gone more physical, you know? And they just looked at it as more of I'm a victim. Right. And all of that, I, I, I think that, you know, we 10X, we 100X enrollment and not just our classes, anything that can help you self-actualize and, and manifest what you want to do. You want to learn how to paint. You want to learn how to play guitar. You want to expand your... When I ask people, the day you thought you were going to do this to the day you actually did it, how much time went by? And most people will tell you, yeah, like I hated this job for two years and then I finally decided and it was like, but what was holding you back here? Most of the time it's a relationship with fear. Right. What if I fail? What if it's not good? What if I lose my security? So I really think that's, it's, it's weird because I'm such a physical guy and I love the training. But if you ask me right now, you could only do one. And let's, let's take it about personal safety. I could teach somebody the entire spear system, ballistic microfight, all the role, role player shit, or I could teach them how to manage fear. I could only pick one. I always now realize I would teach them how to manage fear. Why? Because I've taught people how to move intelligently mm-hmm. and they've hesitated or frozen or not acted. Why? Because if a stimulus gets introduced too quickly, they're still a human being. They could be hijacked by this, whatever fear component is, that anybody, there's so many stories of whether it's an operator or a cop that went and just hesitated for a nano moment too long and then something happened. 
Mm-hmm. And it wasn't because they weren't trained. It was because they weren't stress inoculated to redirect the fear spike. Right. Um, and so, you know, how we get that out there is we, we realize that self-actualization that, you know, I tell people this, I love this expression. We all know what that shitty feeling of fear feels like, right? I'm not talking about like, you know, if I go, uh, you know, Mac, maybe you don't hear, feel this, but I go, Mac, you're going to go talk to this group. You go, great. And then you, I go, you know, what is it? This happened to me at an airline conference where I was told I was going to work with 40 pilots. Oh, fuck, I've taught bigger groups than that. I go there, but then they told me after you're going to talk to General Assembly, which was 500 people on live TV. Well, that at the time, you know, so I don't know what your biggest group is, Mac, but I go, hey, you're going to come talk to these 40 guys. Oh, by the way, they want to know if you'll talk to the, the General Assembly. And you go, fuck yeah. I just finished talking to these 40. And then you go out and you look through the curtain and there's 500 people. They're going to put an earpiece on you, CNN, Fox, everybody. I went like this. I was like, <laughs> fuck. Mm-hmm. Now, here's this. I knew what I had to talk about. I'm an expert. I'm a public speaker. But I immediately let the fear of the size of it, it was a stimulus introduced too quickly to me, put me in the fear loop. And, and uh, it's a subtle thing because Every arena that we move to, you know, we, you know, what's the last thing you're going to say in every strategy call? Got to think bigger. Mm-hmm. Like every new arena is going to bring with it a little bit more of a positive anxiety, a non-clinical anxiety. Like, here we go. High five. Okay, we're on. Right. So um, I think people can get there faster uh, if we explain to them that that the the goal of you know, even Sentinel in my course, I go, if you can look in the mirror after and you go, I will do everything I can to protect my family and myself. Mm-hmm. And nothing else in life should ever cause hesitation because the most dangerous thing in life would be sudden violence directed at me or my family, right. which is the, the philosophical outcome of a Sentinel course is so that, that in a death match, you don't die. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, 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 the outcome of training with me is that in a sudden violent encounter, you know, there's no second place in this death match that you survive. And then I tell people that this is transcendent. Now you're worried about fighting for your business. We're in this pandemic. I have to fight for my business. I have to fight for my family. I have to fight for security. But it's an invisible attack. But the most frequent attack is an emotional attack of, will I figure this out? And I tell people, you can't solve problems if you become the problem. Mm-hmm. And I started talking about, we know what that fear feels like, right? And, and there might have been, for both of you, a moment where you go, well, I thought they were going to lift this ban today, but now they said it's going on another month. I'm okay for three months or six months with savings or whatever, or I'm not. And you get a fear spike, you know, what am I going to do? But you can't solve a problem if you become the problem. Right. So if you wallow in your fear, both of you guys are, are driven type A Let's fucking fix it. Right. We're not the type that go, you know, I got a flat tire. It's like, and I tell, I, I tell people like, like if I timed you, Mac, you're driving at a flat tire. If I timed you, and I actually ask this in questions, in, in, I ask this question in seminars. I go, how many of you had a flat tire? And they go, like everyone in the class has had a flat tire. I go, what did you do when you got a flat tire? And they go, well, we changed it. What did you do before that? Don't fucking lie. And then almost everyone in the class gets out of their car, fucking slams the door, puts their hands on their fucking, looks at the tire and goes, motherfucker, (laughs) now I'm going to be late, right? (laughs) You might kick the tire and then you open the trunk hard and you're wasting energy and time. And what is this? It's it's an element of fear. I'm going to be late. I'm going to have to speed. I hate doing this. I'm going to get dirty. I'm going to fucking get grease on my hand. I don't know how to change the tire, whatever it is. If I tie Mac on the on the tie, I guarantee that he'd be fucking filming. Like, guys, look where I'm film. I'm doing this. <laughs> he would be, but, man. <laughs> right? And, straight. But, but really, here's the point of the story is most people waste so much time thinking about other shit instead of doing clearing the malfunction. Fuck, I got a fucking stovepipe. Mother. It's you're in a gunfight, dude. Clear the malfunction. And so if we start to think, and here's here's one for you, Mac, uh, if you can use it, that when you're problem solving in life. They're just malfunctions. How fast do you, you don't ever hope for a malfunction, but you fucking clear malfunction. Mm -hmm. Ironically, 
Mac actually has shot a video on Malfunction. Hasn't been posted yet. Yep. But yep. it's, it's going to be actually mm-hmm. posted in the like uh, the uh, uh, coaching squad right. on yep. immediate action. Yep. Malfunctions. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Tony. But I, but, I, but I want that. I want that. If I can uh, influence, I want that when because you guys are doing uh, professional and personal development nuances there. Your your people know you as a shooting guy. Fucking life throws stove pipes at you all the time. You can yeah. look at it and go, fuck this, or how do I clear this? How do I get back in the fight? <laughs> yep. And and one of the things I tell people about that, you know, that that failing that is you've got to be able to fail quickly. Don't mm-hmm. spend this much time failing, spend that much time failing. Mm-hmm. You've got to learn to do that. And that comes with, you know, with training. As soon as you fail quickly once, you you realize, oh, I could fail quickly at Anytime I fail, because we're all going to fail. We're all going to fall flat on our dicks at some point. But man, if you could learn how to fail quickly, another thing I tell guys is, uh, is you know, hey, during our classes, we're all going to screw screw up. But one is fail quickly, stay in the fight. And if you can't fail quickly, finish strong or finish looking cool, bro. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, really. Um, but you know, the the change in the tire thing. Just I'm a Christmas story guy. Put a stopwatch on me. Right. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> now, uh, for those who I'm going to go into Q and A here, but uh, for those Tony who are not watching, uh, Tony's got a shirt on that says "No Fear." Now, not the N O Fear crap. This is K N O W No Fear. You've mentioned that you have a course about that. Tell me just a little bit about that, because it seems like that's a that would be a very very important mainstream course for people. Yeah. Uh, thanks, man. Like, so it, it, this is based on my research that started in the eighties. As I always, I always say, this isn't like, uh, like, Oh, everyone's scared. I'll come put a course on fear and sell it. No, I've been, you know, talking about fear mindset. Uh, 1986 came out with a, a videotape called cerebral self-defense, the mental edge. And it was all about mindset and fear management. And this has kind of morphed into this, but what I did is about two, three years ago, uh, then there's this, this idea of like, there's no such thing as no fear because as you expand your other goals in business or relationship mm-hmm. or a, you know, confrontation management, uh, there's going to be a fear spike. And if you don't know how to manage that, that's also going to add delay, time, hesitation. I tell people doubt becomes hesitation. Hesitation becomes fixation. Fixation becomes this non political anxiety. And now you don't have your gun out yet. You don't have your knife out. You're not improvising. You're not, you're not clearing the malfunction. And the malfunction here is an internal, and I tell people self-awareness informs situational awareness. That if we say, hey, head on a swivel, look for anomalies. Well, if you don't have good self-awareness, you don't notice that maybe you're arrogant or an asshole or prejudiced or overconfident. And that puts you in more danger because that becomes your blind spot. So this course I put together was all on, this has nothing to do with physical self-defense. It's about emotional, psychological, spiritual. Mm. How do I cultivate greater self-awareness? There is no critical thinking without self-awareness. Right. Right. Mm. And so to solve problems, you can't become one. So this is all about this, this, what I call the neural circuitry of fear, understanding a fear spike, what it does in your brain, how it hijacks thought, what the fear loop is. And I, what I, so it's normally a course I do for corporations and workshops, the day long program. And, but a few years ago, I realized that people either financially or geographically couldn't get to the course. What do I do? So I took my slides from my keynote, put them online, recorded digital. Uh, it's 97 minutes. Funny enough, I had a guy recently purchase the course, messages me, says, man, I've had anxiety for years and, and, he said, I think it's gone. Like, I, like I'm like i looking at it completely different. I feel totally in control of myself. Wow. He says, is it possible? <laughs> and I said, well, if I was your therapist, I'd tell you no, because I'm still paying off my BMW. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you, we still need you to have your anxiety. Right, right. But, and I'm not knocking, you know, uh, uh, therapy and, and, and so on and so forth. It's just a joke that right. what we're giving people is, is tools where they go, holy shit, I'm afraid right now. What am I going to do? Because right. most people, like the stigma is, I'm afraid to talk about fear. So mm-hmm. it's a program we have. It's an online. It's an online program for people who can't get to the live training, which obviously no one can do right now. Well, again, you know, this is one of those things where I think it's much, much needed, and and I think you know, there's one of those things where, and I have this challenge often, Tony. Um, 
when I teach my stuff is that, you know, I, we all know marketers and I'm a marketer. Okay. But there's a certain moral conviction that I have because you can get market driven in the sense of give the people what they want. Okay. But oftentimes people aren't getting what they need. Right. And, you know, only the teacher knows what they need. They think they need something else. And so what you end up, what a lot of marketers do is they're just kind of going with whatever their latest keyword search is or whatever the latest hashtag is. And so they're going to keep creating stuff based on that. You know, it's very, very short shelf life. Whereas sometimes what you have to do is explain to people the problem first. And so it increases the pain point. So they understand, oh, I really do need to address this. Not that they don't understand fear needs to be addressed, but when Tony Blauer articulates it, suddenly now I have a different concept of the pain related to fear. And now I'm more driven to do something about it. I had this problem with mental motivation, which I started 10 years ago on social media. What I found is people came every day, loved it. But what they would say to me is, you helped me get through a bad day. You helped me get through a bad time. Okay. So in other words, they were coming to the page for daily motivation, daily inspiration. But I said, that's not what I want for them. I want a transformation of their life, mm. you know, so they don't have to keep going back to bad days. So I had to start changing my sales copy to say, well, if all you're looking for is a little motivation to help get through another bad day, I mean, all you're really going to get is enough inspiration to keep tolerating a life that you don't like. Mm. So I got to get you out of daily inspiration into, or, you know, fortune cookie mode, horoscope mode into personal development, which means life transformation, become a life governor, life dominator, dominion agent, executive under God, so to speak, you know, <laughs> making decisions, deter determining, not hoping everything's going to work out, not thinking about it. it wasn't meant to be, not under that fatalistic language that we use, but very, very intentional, very, very deterministic, knowing that with cause and effect, you can create desired outcomes. But I have to amplify and articulate that before they understand their need for it. If I just come out and say, hey, you really need personal development, they'd be like, no, I don't. Right. You know what I mean? They just need another meme about hustle, you know, or some other horse shit, right? So what I love about this is that you're, you know, this no fear concept is an articulation of fear, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's, I think, what's important for our listeners to take in right now is that it's not just about helping you not be such a chicken shit. This is fear is a very, very powerful emotion that does not go away. Like Tony said, you know, new levels, higher levels, bigger devils. I mean, <laughs> the more you go up, man, the more you still got to fight. You're, there's still something to this climb. There's still another precipice where it's going to be steep as hell. And you might not think you're afraid of heights until you get to those heights and you realize, holy shit, <laughs> this is too high for me. But that's why you have to understand fear. You have to understand the dimensions of it. It has to become three-dimensional to you. We have to create this need, I think, so that people understand the value of what Tony's talking about, why it's important for you to know, K-N-O-W, fear. And don't get on here like all the other jackasses do. Every time I talk about fear, they say, false evidence appearing real. Like, you got it figured out, asshole. You don't have it figured out. We don't. I don't have it figured out. I need something like this myself. So, all right. So, Tony, you know, you whispered to me the other day that you would like to do something special uh, for our list. Of course, I really want our coaching group to especially take advantage of this. But what can you do to give our tribe a break? Yeah. So what, what we did with the COVID-19 and the pandemic stuff is is we built a whole new website with stuff that people could get online. And so uh, we put all of our stuff on sale online. The, the the no fear course was 50 percent off um on there and and i'd like to offer like 60 percent to you wow. guys so that you know wh whoever follows uh university badassery and you guys that uh we'll just figure out what the code is you can tell right. me what the code is now i'll it could just be mac yeah. it could be blaze ops it could be you know badass. um well yeah um we'll call it the sentinel sentinel i yeah, love it sentinel yeah. So I'll have my office do that right away. So if they just go to the page and write in Sentinel, they'll get 60% off off of it. And and the thing is, people listening, I know guys who hunt terrorists. I know guys that are SWAT operators I, and they're badasses. They've been in gunfights, knife fights, jumped out of airplanes. And some of them can't say sorry or can't say mm -hmm. I love you to their wife or their right. kid. 
it, I, I, I can remember so many stories where I'm, I'm training, you know, I, I remember doing something in Texas with a bunch of SWAT guys. And I said, hey, guys, you have any questions? And they said, no. I said, let's take a break. One of the operators comes up to me, goes, hey, man, I've got a question for you. I go, yeah, what's it? And he starts to ask me something that should have been asked before. I go, dude, like everyone needs to hear this. Why didn't you ask me? He goes, ah. And, and what he had was fear of public speaking, right? So like you can be excelling in one part of your life. That doesn't mean fear is holding you down somewhere else. So in resonating with what, what CJ was talking about earlier about, about uh, personal and professional development, it's not, this is what the whole no fear message is, is you can't be brave if you're not afraid. If somebody's not afraid of something, there's no bravery. And that's what I was going at is like, you get a fear spike about anything like should. And the fear spike isn't like I'm flinching and pushing away danger. It's I'm hesitating to do intuition whispers in my ear and fear says, shut up. You're not doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's that rocking chair, chair test that most of us have. Like, man, what would have life have been if I had asked so-and-so out or what would have done if I had gone into this business or started this podcast or whatever. So um, lots of information up on there, but it's really about changing our relationship with fear, seeing fear as fuel. Fear is no longer in this car metaphor, your brain and your goals is your GPS. It's your map. The car is your body. You're fucking training with Mac. You're getting in shape. You're learning how to shoot. It's only fear that's going to that's going to get in the way, and I spell it interfere, F E A R, interfere, mm -hmm. the right. fear in our mind that's going to stop in a home invasion or in in uh, 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 being a courageous bystander. It's only fear that's going to make you hesitate. It's only fear that's going to make you hesitate in business or in a relationship. So I can't emphasize enough uh, how huge how huge that is. So in this metaphor, your physique, your physicality is your is your car your mind of what you want to achieve. And so what is it? You're going to dig this CJ. Cause it's like your fulfillment metaphor. Mm -hmm. We say you're not you're, in life. You can't be fearless. That's ridiculous, but right. you can be fearful if you use fear as a gasoline, as it mm -hmm. has it up, burn it down. Right. If, ga if you say fear is my fuel, then when you're outside your comfort zone and you go, Whoa, What's that? That's fear saying to you, hey, motherfucker, let's do some research. Let's get better. Let's expand our comfort zone here. And then fear is your fuel. It's no longer your backseat driver. You're going too slow. You're going too fast. You suck. You're going to miss this turn. That's what most people's fear voice is. You can't do this. Mm -hmm. Who do you think you are? That's that sabotage voice. Yeah. Now, if fear becomes your co-pilot, it's like you look over, you go put your seatbelt on, motherfucker. Here we go. All right. Imagine that, guys. I mean, imagine, try to picture what your life would be like if you were better managing your fear. What would you do? What would you attempt? What would you go after? Who would you talk to? Who would you call? Who would you reach out to? What would be possible? If you knew it was impossible to fail, what would you do? If you knew it was impossible for you to be afraid of something, what would you do? Think of what your life would be like. You really need to saturate in your mind a vision of what your life will be like and know that only fear is ultimately going to stand in the way. You can't get rid of it, but if you can manage it, if you can really, really know it intimately, like Tony's saying, mm. then think of what's possible for your life. Now, I was taught, Tony, to say thank you when someone does something nice for you. So 60% off. Thank you, Tony Blauer, for offering that to uh, badassery listeners, if they use Sentinel as the code when they're shopping, uh, where, do, where do they need to go to? Nofearnow.com. So K-N-O-W-F-E-A-R, now, N-O-W.com, nofearnow.com. And uh, you'll see, uh, scroll down the page, uh, you know, a, a couple of sections, you'll see the No Fear course. And they just click that link. It'll take them to the page. It's on Vimeo. Very legit, secure site. Pop in there, enter the code. You're good to go. Yeah, I'll I'll have uh, the uh, links in the show notes as well as on our link tree menu crap and all that stuff. So, guys, we'll give you plenty of ways to get there. But uh, now, Tony, I know you're crushed for time here. We're going to go into Q and A and stuff. Do you want to stick around, or you need to take off? Um, I've actually got another podcast in a little bit. I can stick around. How, how long does your Q and A take? An hour and a half. <laughs> <Is it? laughs> we're, we're, we're max on coronation we don't have it we don't have time that's what i mean is it because we, we could we'll possibly keep going and getting into whatever so if, if i didn't 
you know, if you want to yeah, so, bail. Oh, so I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll sign off and let you guys do that. Cause if it goes another half hour or an hour, yeah. like, uh, like, uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll miss my next, uh, my next interview. Gentlemen, Max, so good to see you again as always. Yeah. Brother Thank Tony, you. man. Awesome seeing you. Yep. And thanks so much for being a guest on here, bro. I'm freaking rocked. I was in school, man. I was in school again. I was just sitting back listening. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it. And that's why you're such a, you're, you know, I always tell people like, like the greatest coaches are always the best students. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just trying to, how do I get, how do I get better? And you, you know, you said it earlier in your intro, but I, I ask a similar question, like, like, can your today beat the shit out of your yesterday? Mm-hmm. You know, like, like you mm-hmm. should be, uh, you should always be reinventing yourself. Yep. Yeah. How are you, how are you evolving? Sure. I mean, CJ, so good to, to get to know you deeper yeah, man. and, and hear you in your element motivating and, and, and it was great to see definitely a lot of resonance and yeah, I look absolutely. forward to, uh, uh, more opportunities and, 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 you know, Pat and I have been talking about, uh, uh, doing some stuff together, like doing a course together mm. and then pandemic, maybe we'll end up doing stuff online virtually or this, uh, hopefully the world leaders get their, their act together soon and decide that uh, it's okay for the world to start moving again. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll do that. But I, it was an honor to be on, on the show. Uh, no, great to have you, man. We, we could, we're going to love to have you come in as an adjunct professor for the university of Badastri and uh, yeah. peer into our tier one level coaching group and uh we'll uh, we'll pay you money to to talk tony blower to uh to the more intimate circle so thank you again man for being with us it was awesome look forward to uh doing this again i'm sure we'll talk offline okay guys be safe All right, take, pal, care. take care rock and roll all right rock and roll that was awesome man that was great yeah that was great um He's a, tony's a great freaking uh you know teacher oh man and, um I, I mean it's really good even if you if, you know, even if the fight thing isn't your thing, you're right. going to get something out of that. Oh, gosh. You know what man. I mean? Yeah. That's the thing I loved about him is that he was weaving, you know, so much of the life philosophy and deep mm-hmm. mindset stuff and mm-hmm. psychological, et cetera, all into it. Even got spiritual on us, man. Yeah, right on. <laughs> you know, knew he was going to be Bruce Lee yep. when he was hey, three years we, old. <laughs> I, that's, 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 and, and uh, one point there. Um, Tony get, was world famous. I mean, not Bruce Lee level, but you know, world famous in the mid nineties. I mean, people knew him around the world and that you got to realize that's with pamphlets and mailers and magazines right. and shit. Yeah, that's before right. interwebs, man, you know, yeah. and that's without TV being a TV star or movies and stuff like right. that. Right. So that that's, that's some hustle, bro. I mean, that's yeah. good shit. It sure is, man. Um, well, you know, now back to our stuff. Um, mm-hmm. We are now into the second week of teaching in the Pat Max Keep the Blaze Alive coaching group. Now, Mac, I know you're a giant on social media, but mm-hmm. still a lot of this stuff is I'm throwing a lot of new technologies yeah, and things at you and whatnot, which you've adapted to. The videos have been amazing. What do you think so far, man? I am digging it. Well, because it's very interactive. You know, I I, I have a, a a relationship with this. I'm calling them squad members. Yeah. You know, with the guys yeah, yeah. in the coaching squad, they're 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 squad members, and um, I actually like I have a whiteboard of all the little classes I wanna I wanna teach, and I had an original one, I erased it, <laughs> and um, so now what I do is that the ones I want to film during the week, like I want to put one together today on uh, first aid. Mm. And I like that I could, I don't have to memorize anything yeah. because I'm just talking to dudes, right. you know? And right, if I, right. if I have to repeat myself because I sure. screw up a word, I'm just going to do that. I'm not going right. to edit it out. It's right. going to be raw and real just as I am talking to you right now. Right. So I'm going to keep the classes that way because I think it resonates better. You yeah. know, it's not rehearsed diatribe. It's not a bunch of gobbledygook that I've memorized or I'm not reading off of cue cards or anything Teleprompters like that. Teleprompters and shit. Yeah, yeah, man. It's just shit that I know. You know, shit that I know. And if I don't know, I'm going to say, hey, by the way, I don't know this, but this works too. That kind of thing. And then, you know, I'll add notes to it. And then the the feedback's been great too. You know, so I like reading uh, the feedback and, and, you know, communicating with guys who are, who are giving us, giving us this feedback. And for the guys who are on it, don't be afraid to, um, 
because I'm not going to get poopy pants, you know, if, if, uh, <laughs> if there's something you don't like or something right. I said wrong, I mean, if you want to critique, if you want to be a critic, go ahead. I'm not going to yeah. get poopy pants. Yeah. 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 Do it to me too, because I mean, I'm going to bring your, bring your sword. <laughs> yep. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you could, uh, I always say you, you could can't raise get the poopy bull- pants either. You could raise the bullshit flag. Just keep in mind that bullshit flags two way street. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> exactly right. Well, here's what's interesting though. You know, Mac is, you know, we're doing this on this Patreon thing where it's pretty similar to other social media type platforms. So there's a feed and a post and a caption thing that you write, you know, notes and, and then people comment under that and you can yep. reply to their comments and like their comments and all that. D- d- how do you feel now that the people who are writing a comments paid to be there to write that comment? Yeah. So when I'm reading comments on regular social media, eh, sometime I'll answer back, you know, most of the time I do, I, I, I either like their comments or, yes, you know, brief. what have you, but if they ask a big, long question, I'm like, bro, I've got a lot of crap to do today, you know, <laughs> and, and you have to realize that when guys ask questions on social media, you're not alone. There's several hundred others that are we asking questions yeah. too. So I don't have an obligation to them. Right. I mean, if I have time, I'm going to answer them back. But right. with the Patreon, I have an obligation, right? You know, they're paying for content, but it's good content and it's, yeah. it's, it's good bang for the buck, man. Yeah, it is. I know I would pay for that content. It's good stuff. Yeah. And you know, this is um, what I wanted to do was to create this sort of platform for you. You know, because for me, I can, you know, as an, as an observer, I see how guys respond and I see the value of what you represent, you know, as the Sentinel again, incarnating that idea. I see the needs in society. I see where things are going. So I'm looking at it from that, you know, communicator standpoint and following trends and what I'm saying, we need to get positioned for what's coming. And as we've said in other places, not necessarily everybody's heard us, but what we've said in other times, you know, we've been talking about this for a couple of years now. Very difficult to get started because, you know, we both have busy schedules. Yours was busy on crack because mine is always, I'm busy all the time, but I'm here. Right. You know what I mean? I can move time around, but I'm always here at the house. So I can stop, have a phone conversation. Just means I'm staying up a little later tonight. That's all that means. With you, no, you're out of town. You're traveling. You're doing all of these things. But, you know, what is the best use of your time? It's great. And I know it means so much to people to have you boots on the ground, showing them how to do things, going through a set, getting the Mac show, all of that. I know mm-hmm. how meaningful that is. All it is, all that's going to change, you got to fly out here and do it now <laughs> if you want it, right. if yeah. you want it in person. Um, mm-hmm. But, but now it's like, okay, well, you know, there is a value here, Mac, to what you have to share that is going to, uh, it's, it can be so much, it could reach so much, so many more people and it can be so much more effective in this thing. And even though you're covering maybe things that are the, you know, the, the initial top of mind, you know, that, mm-hmm. that, you know, you're going to be getting into deeper and deeper and deeper stuff, not realizing yep. that people want to hear about that. You know, people are going to be want to know like what, like there's a question in here we're going to be asking about morning routines and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. does there need to be a video from Mac on the morning yeah. routine? You know, we can get per- we can get personal on there. You know, that's what it's there for. Yeah. Right. How are your bowel movements, Mac? Max, well, I'm going to do a video yeah, yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now yeah. That may be tier one. Yeah, that may cost right. you extra. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're paying for it. You know, I'm not going to get super personal on social media, but I, but I will on that on that uh, coaching squad. Yeah. So guys, I mean, it's really, it's been awesome. Um, for those who are listening, uh, we have had some challenges with Patreon, which we're working through right now. It's like, I feel like Sherlock Holmes trying to figure this out, but, um, the majority of people have no problem signing up. No problem at all. It's quick and easy. Other people, it's like, you know, breaking through to communist China or some hacking communist China. Um, but uh, for the most part, man, everybody's been able to sign in and, you know, pick any one of these three tiers that we have. So those who are interested want to pursue that patreon.com forward slash coaching squad, patreon.com 
forward slash coaching squad. And again, we're in our second week. So things are kept uh, going to be kept in archive. So you'll be able to go through the feed and we publish up with post other stuff too, man. Cool stuff. We talk about music. We got some music stuff in there. We're going to be doing a whole lot more that's personal. Again, as this grows, Max said something in his introductory videos that this is a journey we're on together and feedback from the community is super, super important yep. because uh, you guys may have and gals may have questions and things and topic suggestions that, you know, could really make this group a better place. But one of the things is and having had one of these groups for five years myself, one of the best parts of this is a community, man. I think some of you folks are going to meet some new best friends. And um, of course, you're going to make great friends with me and Mac, if that's of any concern to you. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been awesome, awesome so far. And so, Mac, you're still enjoying Coronacation? Yep. Busy, busy. I, You know, I have four podcasts this week, <laughs> including mm. this one. Four of them. Damn. Yep. And I was gonna. So, oh, no, I was gonna ask you to be on Metal Bros soon. <laughs> you seen oh, that? Man. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Yeah. Good. Metal Bros. Yeah, but I've been. It's been. Um. Like my my whiteboards are filled every day with stuff that, you know, wants and needs. It's all about that. You know. Yeah. My mission. My mission statement. My daily mission statement. But I'm busy as heck. And and a lot of this is your choice, Mac. You know, yeah, you man. are. This is people don't. You don't have to binge watch. Nope. Nope. I could. I could easily sit on my ass through this, through this Corona occasion. Yeah. But I ain't doing it. I tell yeah. people all the time, if, if it was worth the price of my goals, if it was worth the price of my goals, Mac, mm -hmm. I would definitely watch more television. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, right and uh, that, that, that's kind of the philosophy of what we, what we uh, always do here on Bad Assery. Okay. So Q and A with Mac and CJ. Yeah, man. Okay, so question one. Putting my glasses. For CJ and Mac. And uh, it says, first off, I love the podcast. Well, we love to hear that. Listen to every episode in less than a week. Holy crap. Dude, mm -hmm. that's like 30 of somebody else's podcast. Right. <laughs> How do you listen to all previous episodes in a week? Well, I guess if you're on Coronation. Yeah, right. He binge. Okay, you can't binge watch. But you can binge listen because mm -hmm. that's like college, man. Uh, yep. Anyway, you're some of the only real male role models I've ever had. Well, that's that's uh, that's humbling. Can't wait for the next episode. Well, we're recording it. My question more than anything else. I love pushing myself physically, mentally and spiritually. I love to be challenged. I push myself near physical exhaustion every day. I love it. However, my wife fears for my health and thinks I overdo it. How do I continue this pass, path, but be aware of real limitations? When would it be too much? Don't suck. That's, that's, that's a, without knowing this guy, that's a tough one to answer because what are his, um, you know, how far is he actually pushing things? Right. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. One is uh, limits begin where vision ends, right? So if you can't see yourself doing something, you're not going to be able to do it. Number two, there's no such thing as overwork, but there is a such thing as under recovery. So mm -hmm. you, you've got to find a balance there. Um, you know, people think push, 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 you know, when they say, just get at it, get after it, get you some freaking dig deeper, try harder. <laughs> That's all great, but you have to, um, you got to come back down to earth sometime too. That's both mentally and physically. You know, so there is no such thing as overwork, but there is a such thing as under recovery. So, you know, if, if your wife fears for your health, let her see you chill out, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah. dial back. Let her see you do that. Let her see you dial back. That's yeah, my I, best answer. For this no, one. I, think, I think that's a fantastic answer. Um, and that's the Sabbath principle there. Mm -hmm. You got to right. have some time to rest and evaluate. And here's the thing is, and, and I think Mac and I know this even more now being the age that we are, because we, we all start with piss and vinegar, you know? And one of the things I, there's a blessing and a curse to being a driven, ambitious person, right? Because sometimes it's hard to turn it off mm -hmm. and women oftentimes, and I'm speaking just to men, women can be this way too, but I'm speaking just to men right now. Uh, women are put in our lives as a balancing agent. Because they are advocates for the date night. They are advocates for the trip to the park with the kids. They are advocates for take some time off. 
They're advocates for sit down and enjoy a nice meal. They're advocates for, hey, honey, I haven't heard from you. Why don't you come out of the cave you're in and uh, talk to me? And sometimes we as guys, we're challenged because we see these gurus and social media influencers online playing Billy Badass all the time. And every other meme is a hustle, get up early, grind meme. And you think it, that it's better to live that way. It is not better to live that way. It's better to be balanced. It's better to be one of the great things I heard a guy say, and this was early on, I was a young, young man, and it's common, more common knowledge now, but it really just, it hit me. He's a guy I respected in a profession that I'm also in, a true artist and craftsman. And um, he made this statement. He just said, I'm always in the moment. He said, wherever I am, I'm invested in that. So when he's with his kids, it's all about the kids. When he's with his wife, it's all about his wife. And when it's time to work, right, it's all about the work. That you can be balanced. The only thing that I see about all of this is, even though we're talking about maybe something here that's, you know, him physically pushing himself, I tend to think it's also in other areas too. And so that's that speaks, in order to be that way and do all that takes a lot of time. So, you know, at what expense, my man? Because women will tolerate a lot. They will tolerate a lot. They will endure a lot till finally at some point, something goes off. And they finally say, enough is enough. This guy's never going to turn it off. You know what I mean? You need to be there for your loved ones and you need to be around physically. It's good to push and drive. We, we got to know, you know what that uh, desired outcome is. You know, is it beyond just personal goals? Is it, as I said to Tony Blower earlier, you know, it's maximizing who you are for a purpose greater than yourself. You know, and that's got to include first off family and home and health and all of these balances things. So, but dude, I love the ambition. I would rather have somebody like you yeah. that I got a real back in than somebody that I got to set a fire under their ass. So question number two, how will you guys do things differently after this pandemic? We ain't doing crap differently. We're sitting on our ass at home, bro. <laughs> yeah, not a lot. I mean, I, I've always been, you know, here, here, remember last podcast we talked about, I mentioned how I could see good things coming out of this. Yeah. All right. One of the, it, um, the only reason I'm bringing this up because it relates to this right here. This is question. One of our viewers recommended or suggested that I talk about this. Um, proprioception, awareness of your body and space, awareness. Mm -hmm. People right now are becoming more aware. Wow. Like, you know, the only trips that I make right now are to the grocery store. But you look, people are checking their distance from one another. Their mm -hmm. heads are on a swivel. They're looking around oh, to see wow. if people are sniffing, coughing, sneezing. You know, they're looking at all that stuff. People are becoming more aware. So, I mean, that's something that I've always done. My head's always been on a swivel. I just look at everybody who's living in 45 degree syndrome right. because most people are, you know, they're just heads down, just looking at the floor and their phone. Uh, I'm, I'm, I probably won't do anything different. I'm still going to, you know, wash my hands, travel with wipes, be cognizant of, uh, you know, what I'm touching mm -hmm. and where I'm putting my hands afterwards. Right. Uh, so no, I don't think. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be the same way. I, you know, I think the only thing I would say as an outside observer to Max life, I think the only thing that's going to be different will be more, as he's already said, you know, that business is going to change and he's yep. going to do a whole lot more from his mm -hmm. casa uh, than he's done before. Um, so, you know, that's going to become headquarters now for yep. T-Max Inc. And, but I would say the same thing. Yeah. I think it just kind of elevates things. And Mac, I didn't think about that, how you're kind of now, everybody's kind of getting into a, a sentinel yep. kind of operating system now to where mm -hmm. your language is going to mean so much more to people. And I think that's Pretty freaking awesome. Um, yeah, if anything, the only thing I'm going to change uh, is just, you know, amplifying all these same points because now I've got a justification. I've been trying to get people to do stuff online for the, the longest time, trying to get people to homeschool for the longest time. Well, now I've got all the more reason to, uh, to do that. Okay, um, question number three for Mac. How would you advise someone going go about purchasing their first firearm I know I should take a class, but how should I approach this? Seems like there's so much to know. 
Yeah. So you answered your question within your question. You know, you should take a class because there's so much you need to know. <laughs> you know, uh, well, I mean, it's like, for instance, I wouldn't advise somebody on buying really good tools unless they knew how to use, you know, tools to make a bench or a table unless they knew how to use them. I wouldn't say, hey, you should buy a table saw because then you could build a table. If you don't know how to freaking build a table, why would you build? Why would you buy a table saw? Right. So software trumps hardware. You know, you need the mm -hmm. software. I think software should come first, right? And then you get the hardware. Now, a lot of people right now are going out and buying firearms. So let's just say that you're going to do it anyway. Cheap isn't good and good isn't cheap. I mean, mm -hmm. it's as simple as that, no matter what you're buying. So don't, especially now a pistol is life support. So you can't say, well, I'm going to save... 150 bucks and go with this piece of freaking crap because right. it's life support you wouldn't do that with a two-stage regular uh regulator if you were going scuba diving right. you would buy the most expensive regulator on the market mm -hmm. because once you're down that atmosphere or two right you want to make sure that that thing is supplying you with o2 to your face right so don't do it with a firearm either and then you know now if you go to a gun store you can't take for granted that a gun store store owner is a pro is a professional when it comes to freaking firearms because right. they're not uh, some of them are good the gun store i go to they're they're good they're knowledgeable but you know you might talk to that guy and look for something you know that's ergonomically correct you know that that fits and feels good in your hand like an extension of your body uh but i mean that's 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 all uh, really all i'm going to say about that you know, one of the things, and I've made the suggestion to Mac, and I think now with this question, I think we'll do it because I think it will be a great, and this doesn't have to be just in, in our private group. This could be something that could just be on public side, which is I suggested a long time ago, Mac, I want you to take me to your gun store yep, and we'll buy a gun mm -hmm. because it won't be placating on my part. It'll be the real thing. Mac will literally be showing me what I need to do, what I need to look for, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so we'll just film that, guys, and that will perpetually be on the internet yep. for folks to jive on. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, question number four. Do you listen to albums or playlists? Mac? Right, so me, so me um, the only playlist I'm listening to right now is the one that I – the one that I developed and I developed it for I, you guys out there because the interweb kept asking me to develop a um, what's it, Spotify playlist. Okay. So I did, I built one and it's like 16 hours of freaking crushing flesh, ripping paint, peeling <laughs> tunes, man. It's like 16 and it's all over the, it's, it's all metal, but it's all over the map. You know, I mean, I have old stuff, new stuff, stuff that's, um, people would argue, well, is this really metal or not? But you know, regardless, <laughs> it's like workout, it's motivational tunes. My playlist is called uh, metal Mac attack on Spotify. What I listen to is, uh, I listen to a lot of Sirius XM. Right. And, uh, I listen to a couple Pandora stations too. Okay. So you got internet radio, which you're letting them yep. do the, do the things. Then you got creative yep. playlists. Yeah. Yep. I mean, e even though we are traditional album type guys and we'll make the argument just like any other nostalgic SOB would about, you know, as a kid, what it was like to listen to albums, but maybe we we're just listening to albums because we didn't have much of a choice. I mean, we mm -hmm. didn't, you did make your mixtapes, right? Right. You yeah, got all you yeah. got a badass jams on there and, and whatnot. So playlist is kind of a glorified version, I guess, of the mixtape. That's right. Yeah, so I would I would say that as well. One of the things I love about, you know, I'm on iTunes is that iTunes keeps track of everything. And so I do, so it, it will create playlists for me. I'm sure it does it on the other players as well. And so it'll it'll say every week, like every Monday, it, it gives me my favorites mix. Mm -hmm. And so it's just songs that that it it figures I like. And so I can go through those. And uh, cool. might be one in there that sucks, but they get it pretty good. Okay, question number five. Yeah. Why don't you guys start a band? We did, bro. This is it right here. <laughs> this is in the coaching squad. We're a two piece. Yeah, man. I mean, Top, we're tops and bottoms. You could hear the music. You could hear it. <laughs> you could feel it in your bones, bro. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, maybe down the road once we, because uh, again, I've said, I told Mac before, I, I get a little too obsessed. So um, if I start bringing instruments in here, it's going to get real freaking intense. And, but, um, 
you know, that may be something we do is jam down the road. And if we do, we promise we'll go live with yeah. that. And That'll we will cool. put on freaking face paint. Yep. <laughs> Damn strong. Now, now I have something to really look forward to. Oh, my God. That's right. That's going on my whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, question number six. Well, there's that one I mentioned earlier. Mac, what's yep. your morning routine? Uh, it, it is kind of routine. I do kind of have a routine. Now, as far as like, do I get up at 4.30 every morning? Hell no. Hell no. Because I'm a late. I, I go to bed late. Yeah. I, 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 so I've got I've got security at night, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so uh, um, I go to bed late when I get up like during right now during communication, I get up when it's like when my chickens wake me up, you know, when they start squawking because right. I could hear them out there. It's like, oh, girls need worms. Right. But I start out with the same thing every morning, go to the bathroom and then drink a quarter of water. We've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. But I power slam a quarter of water. It's right down the gullet, no break. Just power slam that quarter of water. It's freaking life changing because you wake up dehydrated. And then uh, I drink two cups of coffee, and that's when I do my sosh right off the bat. Yeah. So answering social media questions, stuff like that. I have the news on in the background too, so I turn on news, and it's usually like headline news. I don't need. Right. Um, I in just depth. I just want the headlines. C-SPAN shit. Yeah, right. Yeah, I don't need I don't need big stories and you know about this country music star has a has a sob story and mm -hmm. I just want what the headlines are and I go through my social media. I peek in on my wife. I keep peeking in on her. If I get up mm -hmm. before she does, I keep peeking in because as soon as I see her stirring, then I bring her a cup of coffee too. That's one of my favorite parts in the morning is being able being able to bring her a, a cup of Joe. That's, that's awesome. basically it. Yeah. That's basically yeah. It. I mean, it, yeah. Uh, not that nobody asked me, but my morning is actually really, really similar. I'll guzzle water. Now my water will have a little lemon juice in it and also some um, uh, apple cider vinegar for pH balance in my gut and the malic acid of the apple cider vinegar amplifies the ketone levels. So then I also follow with two cups of coffee. Mine are uh, bulletproof. So it's, it's blaze ops blend max blend, but then I'll also throw in a tablespoon of butter and a tablespoon of coconut oil, which the brain loves these healthy fats. And it's, it's better than anything you could ever get at Starbucks. I promise you that. Cause there's also a, a teaspoon of uh Truvia sweetener in it. So cool. I'm telling you, man, the, one of the best things you'll ever have. And that's after that is when that caffeine kicks in on my bowels <laughs> <laughs> and it starts, you know, one of the things about, uh, um, and I'll tell people this, you know, uh, I have to think about it when I plan any kind of trip or doing anything with anybody, because I have worked out of home, which is why this Corona thing is no change in my life for shoot 25, 30 years. So the thing is, is that um, when you're at home all the time, you, your body gets used to going to the bathroom and doing all that stuff when you want to. Whereas if you're in a work environment all the time, out and about, you kind of hold it. You're used to holding it till opportune times. So somebody like me, I'll be out with somebody going, I got to go to the bathroom. They're like, you just went. I know, but I, I kind of feel it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause you're so used to just, cause I use it as an excuse now to get up and walk around because I'm seated so much, you know, but uh, anyway, but morning, have a morning routine. If you don't have one guys, it's uh important, I think, and do the water thing. Okay. Number seven, did Mac ever consider joining law enforcement after retirement? I, I never considered joining, but, but I, but I had a fascination with, uh, working with, working with the guys and making them better working. That's all Ellie all over the map. That's County city, state, federal, all of them. I've worked with all, all, all of the law enforcement, all of them, you know, and, and, but here's the thing. Um, and I don't know if this is an LEO asking the question, but I appreciate the world in which they live. It's a world riddled with ambiguity where they have to be the masters of adaptability. They're damned if they do, damned if they don't. They're in constant fear of litigation liability, and there's a fucking lawsuit attached to every round they fire. So not the life for me, but right. thanks for what you do. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mac, obviously you know, a, lot of, a lot of former special ops guys do end up in yep. law enforcement. I'm sure guys even from the unit. Have ended yeah, up man, in, in, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in law enforcement. Do yep. you quote unquote get it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Do I get it? Yep. Um, now, because I know some of the guys, but they're 
a couple that I know are like, you know, county sheriffs, that kind of thing. Okay. You know, but yeah, absolutely. I get it. Yep. But now, not for me. Now, now is there, can you foresee not being in that situation, but you know, we've talked about in the podcast before coming out of dealing with the kind of level of, of guys that you work with into the every man's world. And, you know, there can be slobs and bums and all that crap in police departments as much as they yeah, can right. be yeah. anywhere else. Right. I mean, how do you think of how does a tier one unit guy coexist with other guys carrying firearms? Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be a it'll be a good relationship because he'll have a, a serious positive impact on him, you know, because guys are going to aspire to be like that dude. They're going to want to get better. Right. And I think there's going to be a what those guys will see is a strong a very high level of patience too mm -hmm. they're going to see that it's going to, holy crap man this guy's so patient with me you know i'm he know, i know that he knows that i am overweight you mm -hmm. know but he is super freaking patient with me and uh it's going to resonate well yeah awesome uh okay number 8 how are you guys going to greet people after this shake hands anymore we're going to turn yeah, Japanese I, and bow. Yeah, right. But yeah, I, I still am because I can, you know, like at the end of a class for me, um, I'm shaking 15 dudes hands right down the line. Boom, right. boom, boom. But, um, but I'm also going to go to my wet wipes box after that and clean my hands off. Yeah. No, I, not, I, I, I just am. So I'm still going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm, I've never been much of a big physical greeting guy anyway, you know, like super huggy and right you know, clasping of both hands and on, how have on. you dealt with me to... so far with all that shit? Yeah. <laughs> I'm all over. But if, a guy wants, but if a guy wants to shake my hand, I'm not going to go, whoa, 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 no, no, bro. <laughs> Social distancing, man. Let's tag elbows, elbow, elbow me. No, I'm still going to shake his hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Me too, man. Um, uh, number nine, during the lockdown, I've been letting my emotions get the better of me. Any tips? I've heard this question even on my metal motivation page, dude. You know, um, and we've talked about this having that uh, mission statement. I think this is a big one, you know, and, and I don't know if this guy's listened to the podcast before when I was talking about having that right. mission statement, waking up with purpose, going to bed with purpose, mm -hmm. drawing, you know, your scheme of maneuver out on a whiteboard for the, tomorrow's events, you know, the things that you want to accomplish because your emotions are getting to you because I don't mind. You I know? don't mind. God, I'm just going to yeah. say that. So don't allow that mind to be idle. I mean, I've got so much crap to do today. And the good thing is I've got time. So if I don't accomplish today, what I want to accomplish, I just push those over to tomorrow. They right. stay on my whiteboard. I just don't erase them, you know, but they're on my whiteboard. And if I could get to them today, great. If not, Man, I'm going to push him to tomorrow and I'm going to add five more things to my list tomorrow <laughs> because I don't want to have that idle mind. Right. Uh, because, man, that old. Oof. Nope. Yeah, I think what Mac is saying here is really the crux of it. If you don't have that, then, as he said, your, your mind's going to find stuff to feed on. Mm -hmm. If you don't feed it with work, it's going to nibble on the trivial, right? And in this case, when you're maybe unemployed or possibly facing unemployment or, or worried sick about what's happening. Yeah. Your mind is going to feed on that because it doesn't shut down. It will constantly feed on these things. So you have to, you you feel so much better. You'll assuage so much of that fear and anxiety. If you're busy working on your problems, even if you're just staying occupied, like Max been uh, doing as an example with just setting his agenda the night before, getting it all whiteboarded out, the chores he's going to do. It occupies you, which is a good thing. You're productive. And again, you are reprogramming your psyche, neuroplasticity here, right? You're rewiring yourself to be a doer, to be an achiever, to be a to-do list guy. If you don't get yeah. it all done, like Max said, push it forward to the next day. doesn't matter as long as you are in motion. Never become an enemy to yourself, condemning yourself from anything. Just learn this new habit. And here's the other thing, man is I was telling this to my kid the other day. Again, I say kid, you know, she's 22, uh, but she's finishing up this year of college. And so we're sitting around the table and, and she gets, and I appreciate the fact because she's so diligent and self-governing and responsible. But the downside to that is you get worked up over, over little shit, you know? 
And so she gets all worked up. So we're talking about that. And I'm just basically saying that same thing. I said, just realize, honey, I said, this ain't nothing. Life's got so much more pain in store for all of us. This is nothing. Okay. But, and I know it means the world to you, but just know this is all part of it. This is fun. You get to do this in the comfort of your home. Look at the sun shining through. You and dad just had a hearty breakfast and everything's paid for and the temperature is just right. Life is so good. All you got to do is finish a degree and then we're going to talk about possibilities. We're going to talk about opportunities. I said, the, I said, the freaking metal motivator is your dad. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at all of this struggle and all of these things, man. You're in America, bro. Mm -hmm. No, you're in America. We got so much opportunity. The issue is, you know, are you ready to seize things once this thing begins to lift? Are you prepared for your next season? Are you wired, man, for warfare when this thing is all done? And if you're not ready yet, then coronation is, is showing you your weakness now. Now you know what you got to deal with. Fear, hesitancy, anxiety, all of these things. Master this shit and don't condemn yourself for it. Don't make that your personal identity because if we can change it, then it's obviously not who you are. It's just a habit. Habits can change. Question 10. What do you guys think about the protests to reopen America? Should we co be concerned about government? I'm sure they just mean the. the uh, we should always be concerned about government. <laughs> and this is from Bro. a guy who used to work for the government. Oh, my God, man. I can't believe that there's people out there who, you know, vote for more government. You know, I, mm -hmm. I just. Damn, man. Yeah, we should always be concerned about government. I mean, you know, we run we run the country. You know, that that's what how our government works. We run it, not these dumbass freaking politicians. You know they work for us, and they need to be reminded. So I like that. I like those protests because um, they they've been relatively peaceful. You know they've yeah. been productive, and it reminds government that it's we the people. You know that the politicians are not running things. You know we have a say. Um. And some states have gone too far, you know, with yeah. uh, governing, with governing, you know, where they'll they'll f fill a skateboard park up with sand. But right <laughs> next door, it's OK to go in that Walmart. You know, yeah. it's OK. Yeah. But don't go in that skateboard park. Oh, you can't go on Lake Michigan on Lake freaking Michigan, you know, to go fishing. But you can go in that Walmart. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane, dude. What's. <laughs> happening and you know it's of course everybody wants to demonize these protesters but like you said you know it's very peaceful compare this to the dumbass stuff we saw in portland with Ugh. the masked what the hell what are they called again the uh the antifas antifas yeah, yeah. come on who are actually fas they're the real fascists yeah they're, they're the real fascists <laughs> um this is what protest is supposed to look like and it's okay to protest and yes, they are within the law to have a firearm on their side, you know, even though we would not want to necessarily, you know, uh, front that it's still within their legal rights to do so. Um, and probably the safest place you'll ever be is standing amongst those people. Mm -hmm. And yes, I mean, I think it's easy to demonize these people. And it's amazing to me how much people will defend the state government that's always going to be our biggest threat right it's not an outside invasion that we right. should be fearing it's like max said these you know dumbass politicians and you know when you got bureaucrats in control they they the, the government doesn't produce anything it's they're capitalists in the sense that they raise capital by taxation and inflation they either increase the money supply or you know, they raise taxes. They don't sell anything. They don't offer any service. You know, it's in there. They're there to govern. It's in their interest to sustain their existence. So, yeah, they want you to be scared to death. And so, you know, I'm sure you're seeing the memes now. If you're not, you know, scared of the uh, coronavirus and you got to stay in your house because of murder hornets, which is killer name man <laughs> murder hornets dude. just don't call them asian hornets whatever you do <laughs> chinese hornets nope. can't do it remember when we were kids i was talking to my, my daughter about this remember when we were kids about killer bees yeah right oh yeah killer bees yeah yeah. because yeah. like Those we were, were kids. african 
<laughs> but it was okay killer to bees, call them. yeah. Well, it was okay to call them back then. It was okay to, you know, call them African killer bees because that's where they were from. Yeah, it was. Uh, but that, isn't it funny? It's just the same MO, dude. We had these same yep. kind of scares, uh, f- mm-hmm. pandemic type things, uh, climate change. Yep. Of course, for us, it was the threat of an ice age or yep. running out of few fossil fuels or all of this. It's the same stuff we saw back then is being replayed mm-hmm. today. And it's amazing that it still actually works on people. But again, if you don't have a foundation of liberty, then, I mean, if you don't stand up for freedom, you, you won't have anything to stand up for. So I'd rather, I'd rather have the liberty. But again, the argument everybody is, is you're putting everybody else at risk. Well, that's not a great argument because there's got to be, at, at some point, it's got to be risky because mm-hmm. if human life was as much a value as all these anti-protesters are saying, then we have to stay in every year. Right. Because who wants 60,000 people to die of the flu? Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like, pick your number, man. What number is it that we're willing to let everybody die every year? Because if you're saying, okay, I think 70,000 deaths so far in the U.S. Oh, my God. It's George Report put it in red. So it's, oh, my God. No, that's 10,000 more than the average flu every year. Mm-hmm. That's all that is, 10,000 more. Well, yeah, but, dude, that's 10,000 people. I know. But where are you going to draw the line? Is it 100,000? Because if it's 100,000, then so you're saying we're cool at 95,000. Right. You know what I mean? Where are you going to draw this arbitrary line? So at some point, folks, you got to risk it. So even the people who are processing much, I, I tell them, I said, listen, so I'm going to come back and talk to you. I'm going to ask you in, in uh, October, see how you feel. Mm-hmm. If stuff's still down in August and it starts hitting, hitting your wallet and food shortages and all that other shit. We'll see if you're singing a different tune about the value of life. I think people all turn coat, Mac. Yep. When it hits them in the wallet and the refrigerator. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so again, guys, uh, what was the URL Tony mentioned to us? It was uh, no fear now. Yep, no fear now. Com. No fear now. Dot com to get that sixty percent off, dude. You cut us a break on that, so. Take advantage of that offer. If you guys would like to join us again in the coaching group, patreon.com forward slash coaching group. It is the Pat Mac coaching keep, squad. Keep, keep keep the blaze alive. Coaching mm-hmm. squad. Squad, yeah. And Max, the squadron leader. Two. And I'm Waterboy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great dynamic, man. The page is looking great. Dude, we've had a great time so far. And now we got to, me and Max, uh, we'll talk here for a little bit offline about it, Mac, but uh, still so much more to do for upper tiers and, and things we're going to do. We're going to have some live video in there. We're going to have some Zoom conference call. We get really freaking intimate. That, that way the questions won't come in comments, man. It'll be you looking at Mac's face real time, yep. asking some questions. So you guys can check that out. Guys, I hope you like, uh, you know, what we're doing so far. If, Follow University of Badassery, share it, share this podcast wherever you go. Be a Pied Piper of this amazing show. Mac, once again, thank you for taking the time that you do. Right on. Um, follow Mac where? T Max Inc., almost everywhere. T M A C S I N C. And to follow me, it's at Metal Motivator on Instagram. Everything else is pretty much Metal Motivation, whether YouTube or Facebook or whatever. A website, same thing, MetalMotivation.com. Good things coming, guys. But that's all we've got to say for today. And remember, in whatever you do, don't suck. Metal up.